Never one that once was winsome I'm not too handy or too handsome But I sure do like to play some When I can be the fool Lose the plot and lose my cool I lose my keys but not my conscience Tell me do you really want this Tell me why, 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 why you want to go I've tried, 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 tried to let it show trying to take it easy Right across the top of the page, you'll see a question of the week. You can chime in and check out our question of the week, and uh, you can follow up on the results. So we've narrowed down our bracket. Like if you know, if, if you're if you're a fan of March Madness college basketball, you know they start at 64 and they make their way down. Well, we're down to uh, our next level of of cuts, if you will, and we're going to need your help on that. So I look forward to checking you with Chris Henderson and and uh, and seeing what he has to say about the early results. It's interesting. I mean, for example, I think the question that everybody wants to know, we take it seriously. Who's going to be the next governor general? And I don't know about you, but I want to know what have real talkers told us on on whether or not it should be Ryan Gosling or Ryan Reynolds. For example, the serious questions that demand answers. uh, We'll get into that with Chris Henderson. After nine o'clock, we're going to talk to former Husky Energy CEO uh, Art Price. This Art was named CEO of Husky when he was 30. Uh, which is wild. What a career journey. And uh, well, he has an interesting take on on Keystone XL and the pipeline being canceled by President uh, Joe Biden. We're going to get into that. Uh, Whose whose feet he lays it at. But but here's the twist. Our price doesn't necessarily uh, if I can you know gauge based on comments I've seen him make already. And we'll clarify, obviously, here on the show. I don't think he thinks it's necessarily the worst thing in the world. So we'll figure out why. Uh, We'll get into that. We're also going to talk to Nicole Rycroft today, an environmentalist here in Canada that has just won. um, This has been embargoed up until about an hour and a half ago. In other words, she knew that she won a $3 million prize, an environmental prize that will obviously facilitate research, and we're going to get into it. I don't know exactly what it's all about yet. Uh, We're going to talk to her about it and figure that out after 9.30 Mountain Time, 11.30 Eastern today, if you're watching or listening live. And then in the 10 o'clock hour, we're going to check in with, she describes herself as as an ex-evangelical, the founder of the hashtag Empty the Pews. There's a book of the same name. Uh, Chrissy Stroop will join us just after 10 o'clock today. You know, we love when real talkers are in touch with us uh, by way of talk at ryanjesperson.com. That's our email or using the hashtag RealTalkRJ, letting us know that guests you would love to hear, people you would love to see on the show. 
Chrissy Stroop is one of those. We heard from you time and time again, viewers that were saying, uh, listeners that were saying, you've got to get Chrissy on the show. So we reached out and and we're grateful that she's going to be joining us. We're going to talk about evangelicals in the United States. Uh, How do evangelicals recover from Donald Trump? How do ministers restore people's trust? Ministers that perhaps took people down that path? Or is this even an issue? You say, what do you mean recover from Trump? Trump is perfectly fine. Trump, you know, then maybe that's your perspective. We'll get into that. I want some real talk on the state of evangelicalism in the United States and in Canada, how it's interwoven oftentimes with a, a certain brand of politics. And, and then what we're seeing right here as well, this was all prompted by observations people, including me, were making around faith communities, uh, specifically evangelical church congregations that were defying and are defying mask orders and public health bylaws and the like. Um, I know that some of you have no appetite for the conversation. You believe it to be discriminatory. I'm happy to read your comments on this. I'll be checking the hashtag through the course of the conversation. I've tweeted about it a little bit, and you can find that if you follow me at Ryan Jesperson. Before we really dig into the show, I want to let you know that each and every broadcast that we bring you, every episode of Real Talk, is proudly presented by the team at Bitcoin Well. Uh, When it comes to crypto, they know that it can be a bit overwhelming. I mean, starting at the very basics, what is this all about? You know, do I get an actual coin if I buy Bitcoin? What happens if I lose my computer? Do I still own it? How do I buy it? And what if I want to sell it? They'll start you at the ground floor like they did with me. If you have questions about Bitcoin specifically, uh, they're proudly headquartered out of Edmonton, but they have these Bitcoin ATMs across the country. You can learn more about Bitcoin. Well, just check out the sponsors tab at RyanJesperson.com. This is Real Talk. Here is my dad, Ryan Gesperson. That's our uh, a little guy around our house. We're calling him the king of kindergarten. Wyatt just started in-class learning. He started his, his in-class kindergarten yesterday. As you know, Real Talk started a little late so we could walk him there. And I found out after the show that the technical producer of this show, just an all-around swell guy... Samuel G. Brooks had teed up that Wyatt's opener for me. I think to I think to try to make me cry on the show, but Sam, I was in such a haze and such a cloud. I was riding I was riding a wave of emotional euphoria yesterday that viewers may have noticed that I blew right through the opener. We didn't even have an opener it yesterday. It was a big day for you. Like that's, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But after the show, because Sam Sam sends me a text. Sometimes Sam and I will communicate you know via text while the show's going on and you said something like no opener or we we not doing an opener and i kind of thought oh i went you know first of all i went ah dang it (laughs) the opener Uh, and then i sort of thought it might be weird if i if i get to it like 22 minutes in or something like that i mean we've we've set the precedent a long time ago that that cold opens can be as long as we want and there's no rules here and there's no clock there's physically no clock in the studio we just kind of look at our our phones and our computers this is the only broadcast studio in probably in the country with absolutely no clock on the wall but i was wondering most have like six yeah yeah and they're giant well and they're all they're all coordinated they're like they're like the space clocks that they they check in with the international whatever it's called and and make sure that it's right on time you know you can set your watch to their clock we're like "Eh, you know we start around 8 30 every morning and we finish uh you know when the conversation wraps up and uh we're still wrapping our minds around it ourselves but I, i part of me thought when you sent me that text yesterday, I thought, well, okay, I mean, it's your job to, to be the technical producer. It's, it's your job to oversee the technical production of the show. So I, I go, okay, I kind of get it. Yeah, he's pointing out that we missed the opener. It wasn't until later I realized that you had teed up the very special edition and you were attempting to hit me right in the feels. So I'm glad that we were able to fit it in today. Do <laughs> You saw this from Shane in Calgary. Appreciate it. I Shane did, listening in. yeah. Do you, he, so, so I showed a couple of photos yesterday. I'm not going to make a big deal out of this, but it was a big deal for our family. So I showed you a couple of photos of us walking Wyatt to school I think yesterday. You're, you're allowed to make a big deal oh, about know, your son starting I know, school. But I, but I just, you know, yeah. uh, you know, you know, I'm, you know <laughs> and uh, so Shane, thank you, by the way. So Shane says, as, uh, Ryan, he says, as, as a father of two girls myself, uh, uh, they're just a little bit older than your guy. Those photos that you showed us explain why you and countless others get fired up about what's happening in this province. Uh, He's talking about Alberta, obviously. He says, you're not just looking at the now, you're looking at the future of Alberta for your family and others. I totally get it. Thank you. 
That from Shane in Calgary. Every once in a while, I read an email uh, in our inbox, and I out loud, I just say, nailed it. <laughs> when I read Shane's email, I went, nailed it. Yeah. He gets it. Yeah, I He get gets that. why people care. I mean, politicians even get that too, right? It's why they invoke, like, you know, what, you know you're going to leave this debt for your grandchildren. And then people start picturing their own grandchildren and they go, oh, geez. Right? It all of a sudden resonates, right? They don't, you know, we're laying here, uh, you know, we're going to be in our long term care center, whatever it is, or, or you know, hopefully uh, sitting in a patio overlooking the 18th green. Uh, that's where I'd like to spend my mid 80s. But, uh, you know, and, and, you know, little grandson Billy or little granddaughter, you know, Kelsey coming up to us and saying, why didn't you transition off fossil fuel sooner? You know, with their with their breathing, with with, with their respirator on that they now need to just walk. Yeah, the, you're looking down on the golf course that you live above, and you're seeing everybody wearing you know wearing full face respirators while they're putting. And they've got they've got special <laughs> irrigation systems in play because yeah. it's 49 degrees Celsius in the shade. Yeah. You know. Why didn't you do something sooner, Grandpa? Uh, we're going to be getting into environmental action today, and uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Our our, our guest Nicole Rycroft uh, is of Canopy uh, Canopy Planet Environmental Advocacy Group. And keep in mind, anytime that we're teeing up guests or letting you know who's coming up on the show, you can always check out my Twitter uh, at Ryan Jesperson. Typically around you know eight fifteen in the morning Mountain Time, ten fifteen Eastern. I'll post a list of the guests that are going to be on the show so you can click on them, learn a little bit more about them, see who's coming up, maybe give them a follow if if what they say resonates with you. Nicole has just been announced uh, an hour, I mean, if you're listening live, an hour and 40 minutes ago. She's just been announced Wednesday morning, the winner of this Climate Breakthrough Award. This is wild, a $3 million award. And we're going to find out, I mean, exactly where this is going to go. She's the founder executive director of of Canopy, one of two recipients of this award. It's given to who they describe to be extraordinary climate strategists to develop and implement bold new strategies to confront and mitigate the glowing, uh, the growing climate crisis. Uh, Muhammad Adao of Power Shift Africa is the other recipient, another $3 million U.S. grant. And they also received tailored support from the Climate Breakthrough Project to bring visionary new strategies from idea to fruition. This news release has every possible buzzword, B- like extraordinary, mitigate, uh, breakthrough, visionary. Uh, th- there's a lot of uh, pressure, as you might imagine, and a lot of focus on people that are getting three million bucks to impact climate change. D- do you ever play buzzword bingo with uh, with press releases? Oh, like in, yeah. in news announcements of yeah, politicians. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. L- let me be clear uh, <laughs> to clarify. Uh, yeah, uh. yeah. Um, so Chris Henderson's coming up in just a few minutes, and we're going to get into our question of the week. I did want to take some time to read a few emails, though. Yesterday. Uh, you may have caught our interview with Canadian Senator Doug Black. Um, I received, it's interesting on, to see how the platforms differ. Uh, I heard from some of you on Facebook that said uh, Senator Black was bang on. Uh, some of you on Twitter seemed to be divided, uh, although I, w- I would say it was more, um, you know, uh, people were a little bit more perturbed by what they were hearing from the good senator on Twitter. And then on, on our live chat, in the chatterbox on YouTube, people were losing their minds. I happened to glance down at one point. People are saying, wrap the interview, end this interview. We've heard enough. Get you know." And I was going, okay. Um, it is the show. We, we promise you. We make you this promise. It's something that we're going to be proud of. Uh, guaranteed there are going to be guests. I mean, depending on where you land on the, on, on the social spectrum, in other words, where your priorities are, what social justice looks like to you, you know, whether or not you believe that, that someone's business is your business or not. Uh, wh- wherever you land on, on, on economics, wherever you land on politics, you're going to hear some guests on the show. You're going to see some interviews that really resonate with you in, in a positive way where you go, uh, you know what? I saw eye to eye with that person from the start to the end. And <clears throat> there'll be some interviews where you go, this person is, is an absolute, I mean, they're just out in left field. I mean, they're totally out to lunch. I mean, this is ridiculous. These types of people should not be on the show. And that's just, we're, we're designing the show to be that way. Uh, we want people to feel challenged, including me, including Sam. We want to sit there. I mean, some broadcasts after the show will sit here and just kind of, Sam and I were joking yesterday, maybe we should have a podcast on the conversations we have when we go off the air as we sort through <laughs> what we heard, including with Senator Black yesterday. You know, I'm, I'm sitting there and I, and I did kind of, 
you know, I, I laid out what I thought about the conversation after the fact, and, and, and many of you wrote into the show, and I want to get to your emails. Uh, before we do, I wanted to show you something really quickly. Uh, Sam, is, is my NDI working uh, to, to be technical for two seconds? Can you see that I'm calling up our YouTube gotcha. channel here? Okay, so I wanted to show everybody something. You taught me how to do this, and I'm, and I'm really proud of of our show, even though this is this is just a minor accomplishment. I'm just seeing the uh, the canopy press release. Oh, I see. Uh, so I've got a, your... so I've got to switch NDI over to Safari. If I move back and forth between Chrome and Safari, I the, guess. Oh yes, that's I correct. Have to it only it, it only captures oh, one wow. app at a time. Look look at us solving this on the fly, everybody. The, the are, goal are you... for that is so that you don't have like your desktop appearing and you see you know your emails popping. People up and that people kind could of stuff, see right? how exactly. much money I owed to, to Mastercard. We yeah. don't want that to happen. We don't want your Mastercard bills on. Are on you screen. seeing? Are you YouTube on the screen right now. Yeah, here we go. Okay, you're seeing me. So here's what I wanted to show you, Real Talkers, and this is on your suggestion. You reached out and you said, you know what would make our life a little bit easier? I put it in front of Sam, and Sam said, here, I'll, let me show you how to do it. So if you go to our, uh, if you're watching the shows on YouTube, this is obviously after we are live, right? This is after we are live. You're going to see the description here of who's on the show and, and what we talked about. But check this out. Under the description, you see those time codes? You see there? Seven minutes, nine seconds, Senator Doug Black, right? 44 minutes, 46 seconds, Ryan responds to Senator Black's comments. Also and tells you how long the interview was. <laughs> yeah. Well, no kidding. Well, I knew we got some commercials in yeah. there. We're talking about, we're hashing some things out. We're solving the the world's problems but you're right um you're gonna find let me say more robust interviews here than anywhere else and then our body image roundtable about an hour and seven minutes in here's the beauty of it if you're watching it on youtube you can just go and click i'm gonna go click on 709 it's gonna take me right to the beginning of our conversation with senator doug black so pretty cool that's just a little hack um that we've worked in and uh and uh thanks to those of you that that reached out to us and said you know what this would make our lives a whole lot easier so that's great we did get a bunch of emails and we did get a bunch of feedback. Um, you know, for a lot of you that wrote in and, and, and were sort of saying, um, you know, you know, well, I mean, let me just say it, you know, because I think that uh, Senator Black would laugh at it himself if I know him. And I think I do. You know, a lot of you were saying this was just old man yells at cloud like that was kind of how that interview struck me. Um, you know, some of you had even you know stronger words than that, obviously. You know, I, for a number of reasons, those that's not the type of feedback I'm going to read on the air. Um, some of you took the time to write out really thoughtful emails like this one from Megan, which I really appreciated. Uh, Megan knows, like many of you, that all you do is uh, email talk at ryanjesperson.com and it lands right in my inbox, right in Sam's too. Uh, Megan says, she wrote this about 20 minutes after the show wrapped. She says, you've just wrapped Tuesday's show and I, I felt compelled to write in um, immediately. She's writing about our body image roundtable. She says, so I wouldn't lose that feeling uh, that I have now. Megan says, you know, watching that show, I, I just want to say how much it meant to see the body image panel featured. I'm profoundly heartbroken by parts of the conversation that we had. And by the way, I love that she uses the word we. That's, that's not a small thing that Megan's using the word we. The conversation that we had, she says, and, and, and by many of those side conversation elements that were unfolding in the chatterbox, uh, she says, but that's a good thing. Issues like body dysmorphia and, and body image are deep and they're covered by so much shame that people feel like they can't speak out and, and they have to live with them in silence so they don't appear weak. And what conversations like that one highlight is that those feelings are shared by so many others. You know, if only we had a mirror into the hearts and minds of our peers at the gym and at the store and online and in the world around us on a daily basis, we could see the conversations that they have with themselves Megan says, it kills me that we learn to feel inadequate from such a young age and that the silent stigma forces so many to grow up with trauma that is so undeserved. Megan says, thank you for allowing this show to shine a light on that for a brief moment. From the conversation I saw in the chat, I know I'm not alone in feeling this way, Megan says. Mental health continues to be a valid and very necessary piece of conversation well beyond the confines of, of any corporate initiative like Bell Let's Talk. And I'm glad to see Real Talk walking the walk. She says, if you feel inclined to share, my message to Real Talkers is this. Uh, to any and all of us that have ever been made to feel like we're not enough, alone, or unworthy, I want you to know how wrong that is. Megan says, each and every one of us has value and worth far beyond what we see in the mirror and what others choose to see when they look at us. You are loved. You are worth it. And you are enough. And on the days when you don't feel it, that's okay. And on the days when you do feel it, Take a minute to reach out to those who may not. 
This world is hard, but together we can make it count. That from Megan, a real talker. Isn't that, it's not, when we receive an email like that, I, I sit here for a second and I just go, there's something happening here. I, I absolutely adore that she uses the word we, Sam. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I, even like right even this morning, there's like, I, there's sometimes in the morning where I'm just like, you know, I'm getting up and I'm, I'm kind of in that transition phase where I'm working on the show at home a little bit and I'm getting ready to come to the studio and there's like, you know, like uh, two or three seconds where I'm just like, oh man, I, I kind of want to keep the pajamas on and just pour myself another cup of coffee. Um, it's motivating to come and hang out with this community every Isn't day. Isn't it? And like, I, I, I say that very sincerely because... You know, if I look at what my life was like at the beginning of November last year, before we launched the show, I didn't have, you know, 30 or 40 people that I interact with, with, you know, on a regular basis that are the regular commenters. Exactly. Not to mention everybody on Twitter and everybody that comments after the fact and everybody that's sharing the podcast. So it's just, it's, it, you know, it, it's rare, I think, that you can foster a, a community project out of a media project but but we're getting there totally it's great um i'm i'm i want to get to a couple other emails here before we get to chris henderson and and i'm also uh just to be nerdy and geeky and talk tech for a second sam i think we're having issues with ndi which which might be somewhat problematic hmm. because we want to be able to show real talkers what we're talking to chris about but you'll have to bear with me i'm going to control what i can from this end i love this from mike scott uh mike's listening in from from Cowtown, and he says, uh, this is another thing, um, positive reflections presented by Kubi Energy. Every single Monday, you send us an email, talk at ryanjesperson.com. It could be like, what, two beaver sent the, the dog chasing, I think it was JoJo was the dog chasing its tail for like 45 straight seconds, which I would have watched it for three minutes. Um, whether it's a photo of a sunrise or chalk art by a teacher or a story of an 11-year-old girl being found, an 11-year-old girl that had gone missing and her family was quite concerned for obvious reasons, and we read the story of community members mobilizing and going out to find her and finding her thanks to a good word from a bus driver who let them know he had dropped off a girl that fit that description. They found her at a bus stop, shivering, cold, scared, said she was lost, needed help getting home. I mean, whew. so we hear the story firsthand. It prompts Mike to reach out and he says, I came home exhausted from work earlier today. He says, I, I just was not feeling myself. He sent me this email at 11 at night says I wasn't feeling myself and I decided to finish my day by listening to the Real Talk podcast before heading to bed. And after hearing the story of that little girl that went missing and then was found by caring citizens, Mike says it really touched me. Says I can go to bed now knowing that there are still people in our world making a difference and caring for their neighbors, especially during a pandemic. Thank you, Real Talkers. That from Mike, who's watching in from Calgary. Just absolutely amazing. And then emails from people like Phil. Phil heard the interview with Doug Black yesterday. We're talking about energy. We're talking pipelines. We're going to talk about that with Art Price, former CEO of Husky Energy, coming up in, in, you know, a while. We'll call it 20 minutes or so. Phil with a suggestion on what he'd like to hear on the show, content he'd like to see. Says, I'd be curious to see if you could put some guests together talking about the impact of all of this on older workers gaining re-employment during this pandemic. There are so many of us out of work across sectors he says, I think most companies will hire young workers over old ones when things turn around. So that means that everybody, you know, everybody in their 50s and older right now and unemployed could be unable to find employment ever. Phil says, thanks for your consideration. I love that idea. So that's on our working list, Phil. And when that segment happens, not if, but when that segment happens, Phil, it's because of you. And we appreciate that very much. Speaking of Kubi Energy, wanted to remind you that they are Tesla certified solar installers with two. I mean, they're going to they don't want they don't want me saying they have two head offices. They're proudly based out of Alberta, but they, they're also working in B.C. out of their Kamloops office and doing a ton of business in commercial and residential uh, using only uh, journeyman electricians. So, you know, the job's being done right. Plus, Kubi takes a lot of great pride in filling out all the forms and handling all the permits for you, making sure you get the reimbursements that you qualify for under certain levels of government for going with solar. You can check them out online. Just follow the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. It's also where you'll find the team at Friesen Brothers. They're getting set to open their 15th Alberta location. It's in the Rabbit Hill location in South Edmonton. It's their first time 
in Alberta's capital city, and there's a ton of buzz for good reason. They've been supporting Alberta producers for the more than 60 years that they've been family-owned and operated. Friesen Brothers is Alberta-grown and Alberta-owned. All right. Let's get to this. Uh, Absolutely loving how this week's edition of the question of the week is playing out. That's thanks to the good team at Y Station. They are the official research and strategy partner of Real Talk. That's where Chris Henderson is senior strategist and partner joining us this morning. My man, a good morning to you. How are you doing? Good morning, Ryan. How are you doing? I'm doing I'm great. Doing all right. This this uh, question of the week is is different than anything else that you and your team have put together for us. Um, it's usually uh, I, I would say pretty serious. It's usually it's usually totally serious as we sink our teeth into the yeah. story facing Canadians, and that's not necessarily untrue. But we took it from a different angle. Your team did this week. Yeah, and uh, so this week we did a bracket to see. You know, we we put a bunch of famous and well-known Canadians, people that contribute to public life and people that are globally famous Canadians. And we asked, we asked your, uh, or we asked the real talkers to um, choose who they think would be the governor general. And I, as one of the people on the team that reads all the comments every week, uh, this was, this was a, a, a I know, I, I want to thank everybody. This was a fun week. Okay, so um, uh, th- we're, we're getting kind of screwed by technology here, Chris, which is, is unfortunate but not devastating because I want to show people uh, what this looks like on the screen. But all they need to do, uh, in the absence of me being able to do it, is just go to ryanjesperson.com themselves. They go to question of the week at the top. And and so the reason why we have you on today, uh, I mean, number one, just because you, you bring joy to our lives, Chris, but number two <laughs> is because we need everybody that answered, that, that, that chimed in on that first bracket on the first round. We need them back starting today yeah so we we broke it we had we started with 32 we're down to eight um on in the one division we've got beverly uh, we it came down to beverly mclaughlin chris hadfield margaret atwood and indira samrasekra and they'll be going up against the champion of ryan reynolds sandra O, oh, lauren cardinal and dan levy Okay. One of, one, yeah. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, one of, one of the things we were trying to see is how seriously people would take this. Um, and, uh, and I was, you know, of, of all the sort of celebrity lists, like the, you know, we had, we thought that Keanu Reeves would do a lot better. Uh, we thought that uh, we thought maybe Ryan Gosling would do better. Uh, but the, the, of the, in the, in the celebrity division, you, people can pretty much pick the most serious people. Uh, and, uh, so I think people are, are, were pretty, took this actually pretty seriously. There were lots of like funny comments and some people took it a little bit too seriously. Um, what, do, what do you mean about people taking yeah. it too seriously? Uh, I mean, some people were kind of mad about who people that we left off the show or oh. off the, off the bracket. Uh, there were, there were some really great suggestions for people that we should have put on. Uh, I mean, obviously we, you know, we have to, we had to make some choices and, um, and some of them were maybe a bit more entertaining than others. Was there a uh, recurring but, you know, name that, that was excluded from uh, the, our original yeah, list? Yeah, three names came up over and over again. Not over and over again, but came up a number of times. Buffy St. Marie, Rick Hansen, and Rick Mercer. Mm. Uh, and I think they would have been legitimate people to put on there, but you know, we chose certain people and not other people. But Rick Hansen think, and Rick Mercer would uh, yeah. both be phenomenal Rick Hansen yeah. would be an incredible governor general, don't you think? Yeah, I, he, he was by far the, uh, as far as write-ins go, he was by far the most, uh, the most requested. The um, the thing is about when we ever we do these questions of the week is that we're we're always kind of looking for that insight in the comments about, and you know the theme that everyone's bringing to it, and you know, and sometimes you know the like last week people were had a lot had a lot to say about coal. Yeah. Uh, but this week, people had a ton to say about, like, and you know, and I, I I've got to give credit to the audience because they, the even though this is sort of like a bit of a more, a, more of a fun exercise, they were, um, they they delivered a, like a, they were they delivered some great commentary, including, you know, should we have a governor general at all? Um, and th- that question came up, and it got you know they people offered their opinion on that so much so that actually in this bracket. After you're done, when you've chosen who your governor general you want the governor general to be, you can you can say whether you think Canada should have a governor general at all. 
Uh, and it's really thanks to those people that said, you know, this is fine and I had fun with this, but maybe we shouldn't have a governor general at all. Uh, we, we, I'm just reading the live chat right now. Uh, I mean, some people are saying obvious things here, like, uh, Chris, you know, if you wanted Ryan Gosling to do better, you should not have put him up against Ryan Reynolds in the first round. I, I think that's an, you gotta, ob- you gotta put, you gotta, you gotta put the Ryans against each other. Yeah. I'm sorry. Luke says, uh, Dan Levy, you know what? What if you put the Ricks head to head? What if you put Mercer head to head? against Hanson. Yeah. That would be an interesting one. Uh, Luke says Dan Levy's great. That's a fine choice, but I would love to vote for Catherine O'Hara. Uh, there you go. Chad, bring a little more seriousness to the conversation, a little, a little more heat, says the way that Indira operated the U of A when she was president, not a damn chance. Chad's not happy about that. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, people are... And, and we were very surprised she did as well as she did in this. We, we I am too. Uh, we actually, we, we ran the numbers again when I saw that. I was like, that can't be right. And I, and, uh, yeah, I, so, sure so I, uh, I, um, a lot, of, and a lot of people are talking about your LL Bean sweater, by the way, as well. People are saying that Shane says he really digs the look. So, um, I, I it wouldn't be in a, it wouldn't be representative polling if I did not share the write in. People are writing in about your sweater. It's not on my list of questions for you, but it's a write in. It's, it's a write in. Every everybody at our office, if the if anybody at our office is watching this right now, they are going to be. Like they're going to know how validated I am because this is my favorite quilted sweater. I have <laughs> several colors. Is that it, is right? a, it is a great, it, yeah. I, I like no, when I say several, I have three more on the way. I have this in seven colors. <laughs> this is a great, this is a great pandemic sweater. It is, you can get it at llbean.ca. Uh, and it is, it's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the, you know what, actually though, people were good. If I did let you go and you had not shared where you got it, people would be saying, why didn't you ask him where he got it? So uh, thank you very much for that. It, it strikes me as like, I just, I mean, I don't want to get all weird about it, but it strikes me as like people, you know, people, people that have invested in a great sleeping bag, you know, they know oh, that, yeah. that once you're in that sleeping bag, it's very difficult to get out of the sleeping bag. It's hard. So I can I'm understand. Carrying, it's, you know. like, it's like wearing a tiny duvet all day. Yes. Yes, it's a wonder you get any work done as a matter. It's a wonder that you showed up on time for this interview wearing so a I'm sweater. I'm going to sleep right after this. Yeah. I'm going to nap right in this chair. Okay, so I, I I need to know where you think. No, although is that we don't want to influence the poll. People are going to be saying, I, we, I can't we ask do you. Have, I I think I know who will win the divisions. Okay. But it's really up, it's really up to your, and I'm not going to say who, but it's really up to your audience to determine It'll be interesting to see just how seriously they take this in the in the end. Okay, so uh, if it, you know, and, if yeah. somebody did not participate in the first bracket, they can still participate in 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 rounds three and four right yep. now. Okay, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so we we need everybody right now to go to RyanJesperson dot com and answer the question of the week. And, and if you've got a favorite on that list, you should tell your friends and family because. There were there were a lot there was a lot of sadness at my house when when it was discovered that Keanu Reeves did not make the cut. Well, what do you? People I mean, you've mentioned I really upset. like Keanu Reeves is actually if you read about him and what he does with his money and how he supports film crews and he's actually a phenomenal yeah. he's a phenomenal dude. But um, yeah. what is it? I feel like on my list he would have been, and I say this with respect. It's just you you put a great list. Together. I mean, Murray Sinclair didn't even make it through, and, and I think Murray'd be an unreal <laughs> Governor General. That was that, that. I think that was our biggest surprise is that Murray Sinclair didn't make it through. Yeah, you and me both. Um, big score says Don Cherry for Governor General. Um, no. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> no, Christ- no, Christ- no. Christina says if Julie Payette was toxic to the staff, I, I can't imagine Don Cherry being any better. Um, I love Don Cherry, but he's got his, he's got his place. Um, oh, geez. I've just, I've started a forest. What I've done is I've just extinguished a cigarette in a dry forest and not completely stomped it out. And now I'm walking away and we're going to see what happens 20 minutes from now. But what was it? What was it about Keanu Reeves in particular? I'm just, I'm just curious. I mean, I think people, you know, like eight months ago, you know, it, it, you couldn't you could swing a dead cat without Keanu Reeves being you mentioned. And, you yeah. can't say that anymore. Okay. Well, you know, the, so. You the, know, I, uh, you know, I did an interview with a guy like literally two years ago that he was using like, like every animal abuse metaphor in the book in the same. Okay, so I, I, the, no, the guy's I, saying to I, me, first of all, the interview starts, I, I'm not even gonna say who it was, but. 
a prominent Canadian executive. And he starts with saying, well, Ryan, I don't have a dog in the fight, but blah, blah, blah. And I was kind of like, okay, yeah, that's not the worst. Like, I, I'm okay. I'm not too, you know, sent, I'm, I'm, that's fine. Um, I'm not Michael Vick, but I'm, you know, I can handle the, the yeah, metaphor. Yeah. And, and then he okay. goes on and, and then, and then I ask him to solve a problem for me in the interview. And he says, well, there's a number of ways to skin a cat. And I'm sitting there going, man, nobody's skinning cats. Nobody watching yeah, okay. this. I, you want- I, I apologize. I, you can't swing a stick without hearing a thing about Keanu Reeves and, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and, and people loved, I mean, I, mean, I, I just thought he'd do better. And he, I think he got beaten be- down pretty badly by Alanis Morissette. Oh, isn't that ironic? And then Alanis Morissette got her, got hers handed to her by Sandra O. Oh. And then that's why Sandra O oh showed up on here. It is, it was, it's actually fascinating to see the paths. Uh, the rock did really badly. People don't. People on the in the chatterbox don't like that the Rock was even an option. I mean, he's eligible to be Governor General. He's a, he's been a Canadian since two thousand and nine. I think he's, he's like he, voluntarily became Canadian. He, like he, he he like sought Canadian citizenship, and you, that's you why sound he su- you sound surprised that he did badly. Yeah, no, that he sought to be Canadian. I, I mean, he doesn't have to. <laughs> I mean, he's. Okay. Like, but like, I think it's weird. I, I do think it's kind of weird at 45 for one of the world's biggest celebrities to be like, you know what I'm going to do? Be Canadian. I'm going to go be Canadian. Yeah. That's what I'm going to, I'm going to put that, I'm going to put that train or, or like, you know, go be, you know, uh, you know, like become a citizen of any country at that age. So I'm, um, I'm, I'm, a, I like you a lot, Chris, but I'm, I'm a little, yeah. dis, I'm a little yeah. disappointed that our entire live chat now is almost exclusively about quilted sweaters. Um, I'm going to work. I'm not, I'm a quilted sweater gang. <laughs> I'm going to work. So. To, I'm going to work to get the audience back, um, over the next okay. hour or so. In the meantime, I would like to thank you and your team for your amazing work it, to be serious for like five seconds. Um, there's a ton of effort that goes into something like this, and we're really grateful to have the team at Y Station uh, side by side with us on this type of thing each and every week. So thanks for checking in, and I can't wait to see what the final result is on Monday. Obviously, what real talkers decide—that's what happens, right? So, yeah, they, they, this is the definitive. This is, uh, you know, Prime Minister Trudeau called me and said, "I'm going to make my yeah. choice based on what's there." So, yeah. Exactly. So, you know, like get your friends and family in on this because this is for real and uh, it's definitely happening. Tell your friends. That's Chris Anderson. Thanks, pal. Senior strategist at Y Station. Y Station is our official research and strategy partner. You know, speaking of our partners, we're checking out the Real Talk RJ hashtag right now. That's where you can be in touch with the show anytime. Not just during our hours of operation, so to speak, while we're live with you each and every morning, but through the day. That's the hashtag where we... Well, I suppose we curate uh, some of the comments and keep an eye on what you'd like to see here on the show. The team at Park Power oftentimes chiming in on that hashtag, by the way. They're, they're, they've got to be one of the most engaged corporations I've ever seen on social media. They do an amazing job. Uh, that's where you can find them on Instagram, on Facebook, Twitter, wherever. If you want to learn more about the services they provide, all I re- really need to tell you is this. Um, if you're in the province of Alberta and you need electricity, natural gas, or internet, in other words, everybody, uh, you're going to pay somebody for it. So why not go to parkpower.ca, use the promo code 2021-REALTALK, and they'll give you 70 bucks off your first bill, whether it's commercial or residential. 70 bucks by using the promo code 2021-REALTALK. You know, there's also a promo code I want to tell you about for the team at Grand Dog Essentials. It's quality raw dog food. It's what we feed our dogs. And if you go check them out online, order online at granddog.ca, use the discount code REALTALK. They'll take 10% off your first time order. Not just that, they'll deliver to your door as well. So whether you're watching in like like Steve is, just got an email from Steve in Calgary or in Edmonton or even in Red Deer or Central Alberta area, they deliver weekly. We get it really, I mean, it's so easy right to our door. Again, Grand Dog Essentials quality raw food. Let's take a look at the news headlines. Well, of course, all eyes on uh, the vaccine uh, and this new variant of COVID-19, a new strain. We're going to be talking about it in more meaningful fashion tomorrow. Want to let you know um, the numbers are out. Alberta now has 57 cases of coronavirus variants uh, that were first. These are these new strains first identified in the UK and South Africa. Eight of those cases have no known link to travel. So that's significant. Um, uh, Alberta's chief medical officer of health, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, saying yesterday afternoon there's no evidence 
uh, here that that two schools that are at risk of being exposed after uh, family members of those traveling outside of Alberta tested positive. There's no evidence that these schools are at risk of being exposed, but there is a daycare in the province. They're not identifying. They say they're keeping an eye on four cases linked to that outbreak. And of course, we'll keep you posted on this as well. This story developing um, with significance in Canadian provinces, including BC, Alberta and Ontario. They're saying that this new variant could be overwhelming healthcare systems by mid-March. And we'll take a look at those stats tomorrow. Uh, meantime, the European Commission says it's already authorized vaccine delivery to Canada and that in very limited cases, uh, it'll apply COVID-19 export controls. Uh, in a statement to CBC News, CBC reporting this this morning, a uh, spokesperson saying there have been only two requests for delivery, one to Canada, one to the UK. So what does this mean? Well, Canada is aware that the European Union has the duty to ensure citizens are vaccinated ASAP. Right. So they're trying to find the balance. These these countries, these partners uh, alongside these pharmaceutical manufacturers. How do we get this done? And to as many countries as possible, to as many people as possible. You know, right now, vulnerable populations in particular, people want to get them vaccinated as soon as possible. And in the tech, I mean, geez, it's not just tech. It's not just the stock market. I mean, this is one of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, An announcement yesterday from Amazon, Jeff Bezos stepping down as CEO later this year. Uh, He's held the role. He's one of the sort of the rare hangers on, Sam. Hey, Jeff Bezos. I mean, you think of, I guess, Mark Zuckerberg is another um, still really steering the ship at Facebook, but most tech CEOs have stepped back. Uh, Yeah, uh, you you sort of notice, I mean, you kind of have that, I think a very big trend in tech is you sort of have that founder figure that that kicks it off and is sort of the charismatic young whippersnapper that gets the company off the ground. Um, But but oftentimes they search for, you know, a little bit more experienced leadership to write the ship. So, yeah, it it seems... um, 25 years is a long run for Bezos to be there. No kidding. And so he's, I mean, he's still going to be doing a bunch of stuff. Uh, He said uh, in a note to employees that you can read yourself on Amazon's website if you're included uh, or inclined, I should say. He says as executive chair, he'll be staying on. He'll stay engaged, focusing on the, the Bezos Earth Fund, the Day One Fund, Blue Origin, the Washington Post. He's got a whole bunch of stuff going on. Obviously, he owns the Washington Post. Um is Art Price ready to go? Or oh, he is ready. This is great. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Art Price, uh, I mean, geez, I don't even really know where to start in my conversation with him. I want to pick his brain on on how you wind up as the CEO of Husky Energy when you're 30 years old. I mean, that's that was that was Art's story. A former CEO of Husky Energy, chairman of the board for Sunterra. Obviously, you've heard of that uh, company and and uh, doing a lot of work now as well in the uh, internet access space. Maybe we'll have some time to get to that. But it's Art's comments on pipelines and government's roles in those pipelines that's got a lot of people talking. Thanks for making time for us this morning on Real Talk, and welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you. I look forward to it. Yeah, Art, let, let me just let me just ask. I mean, I'm reading your bio and doing a little bit of research on you to prepare for this interview. Uh, to wind up as the CEO of a major energy company by 30 years of age, that's that's a, a meteoric rise. Um, your your experience in the energy space is uh, pretty significant. You've been there for a long time. How have you seen it evolve through the course of your career from from back in the early, you know, let's call it the 1980s through till now? It's a it's a dramatically different landscape, isn't it? Well, in some ways, it's dramatically different. In other ways, the fundamentals are still the same, right? So uh, what happened when, in the late 70s, we were in an Alberta economy that was growing rapidly. Uh, I happened to be with an organization that allowed young people to progress, sink or swim, and I swam more than I sunk. So uh, that's how I became a lead executive at Husky at the time. And... Uh, I was also the chairman of the Independent Petroleum Association. And if people go back, uh, that was the early 80s was the National Energy Program and major restructuring of the markets, both from a policy point of view and a supply and demand point of view. So if you were young enough to be through that, then this is got a lot of similarities if, if if we talk about the national energy program and the impact that it had uh on on western canadian companies and on western canadians um it provides some insight i think into into why the surname trudeau can act as a bit of a trigger for some people um if, if you take a look at, at some of the i mean i think it's been an ongoing adverse relationship and, and correct me if you think i'm wrong on this but but between the province of alberta generally speaking some premiers have taken different tones, but but Peter Lougheed fought with Ottawa in so many ways as Jason Kenney fights with Ottawa. The message may be slightly different, 
but there has been that adverse relationship. Have you perceived that to be consistent in its in its intensity over the past few decades, or or have you seen an ebb and flow? Have there been times of peace between Western Canada, Alberta in particular, and Ottawa? Well, that's a big question. I think you have to cut across industries for that. I mean, I've been lucky enough to be involved in agribusiness, in prop tech now, and uh, and uh, steel industry, and so on. Uh, there's always been the central Canadian entitlement dynamic against the Western Canadian competitors. Uh, if you kind of think about it, the Western Canadian economies, Saskatchewan, Alberta, more not quite so much British Columbia, we earn our standard of living by exporting and competing on a global market. And all our industries do that. Our agribusiness sector does that. Our oil and gas industry does that. And for all intents and purposes, we compete without grant subsidies in a global market. And then if you turn around and say, let's let's on a, um, even on one hand, how many central Canadian companies that are at the core of people's uh, grasp actually compete defined by exporting their products and services without grants or subsidies, right? And the telcos don't. The banks don't. Uh, the car industry, assembly industry doesn't. So many central Canadians live in a government sector or a private sector that isn't competing in the global marketplace. And I think that's at the core of the um, friction between Western Canada and the people that basically earn a living competing and uh, Central Canada that basically earns a living off the rest of Canada. So we talk when we talk about the global marketplace and we talk about global trends, a lot of times in the conversations around whether you're talking about a, a carbon tax or social license or pipeline development or exports or whatever, there's that reality that global markets or global trends are dictating a lot of things, including demand for oil and gas. Uh, for whatever reason, people typically talk about the next 40 year block. I guess we could talk about the next 20 years. We could talk about the next hundred years. What do you believe? I mean, there seems to be no denying that global demand is still healthy for oil and gas, not to say that Alberta shouldn't transition its market, not to say that there shouldn't be uh, investment in some infrastructure. Uh, but what do you believe the market looks like? What do you think demand looks like? What do you think intuitive policy would look like based on the fact that it is a global market, like you say? Well, you're either in the free market which is basically the Canada United States uh, region is the home of the free market in oil. Let's pick oil. It's the most topical part. You can't throw gas quite into the same category or you're over there in the managed sovereign economy market. So that's OPEC plus Russia who's in the formal member of OPEC, but joins in the debate and a bunch of satellite countries that do the same thing. So you really need to think of it. And ever since the mid seventies, anybody in the oil industry has been thinking about, that's in North America has been thinking about the demand for North American free market oil versus the demand and production of the sovereign OPEC and related parties oil. Art, right, we're getting a lot of a lot of people are chiming. Let me ask you about this because I want to do this in real time. A lot of people are watching right now, like like Ryan and Heather and Aaron on our live chat. They're saying, "Hang on a second." They're saying Art's talking about you know there's no subsidies. Um, you know, I, I would say people are saying how you know our definition of subsidies must differ. I'm assuming that they're going to be talking about things like tax breaks, talking about things probably like federal funding to clean up orphan wells. I mean, I think there probably is there probably by definition are many subsidies that oil and gas producers have seen. Would you acknowledge? Well, there are parts of the normal tax system that everybody has that allows people to deduct investments against their income. I don't call that a subsidy. 
Everybody in Central Canada gets that. So we can always find the outlier, but there aren't structural subsidies as there are for most Central Canadian industries. If you read about uh, the electrical, the shift to electrical car manufacturing in Canada by the Americans. Every one of those start with a 40% grant from the federal provincial governments before they even turn a wheel. So the, there's always misalignments in the market, but they're not on the scale that, and now we're talking about oil, but let's talk about agriculture. Let's talk about dairy. Let's talk about telecom, right? So I'm, you know, in a conversation like this, there's always the outlier exception, but I'm talking about fundamentally way, the way the industry actually works. Well, let's talk Better. about Keystone XL. This is, uh, I'm not sure how actually divisive it is, Um it's tough to tell. Sometimes we try to cut through the noise on this show. Um, it seems to me, I think the majority of Canadians probably thought that Keystone XL was going to get canceled. We got some interesting polling by way of our question of the week last week. Um, Alberta's government would have you believe that we can influence uh, President Biden's decision. They want Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to do more on this file. I want to ask you about different levels of government levels of culpability or, or what you believe could have been or should have been done on this. First of all, uh, let me ask you the basic question. Is it a big deal in your estimation that Keystone XL was canceled? People, some people argue that it's devastating for the Alberta and Canadian economies. Other people say there's other options. There's other pipelines. It's really not that big of a deal because we still have pipeline capacity. What do you think? Well, it was a pipeline fundamentally purposed for growing production in the oil sands. It wasn't purposed for existing production. And the growing production in the oil sands has essentially been canceled by the market. So, you know, it's nice to have pipeline capacity, but if you have spare pipeline capacity, it's just a overhead cost to the industry between the productive industry and the marketplace. So I think it's not a big deal. These pipelines can always be built if the market lines up with the pipeline in the future and the policy framework and the economics line up in the future, pipelines will get built. We always have steel. We'll always have the oil sands. If you talk about right now today, to say it is a devastating thing to the Alberta economy is to say the only thing the Alberta economy depends on is growing oil sands production oil. And that's not the future of the Alberta economy. It may be, but we sure can't plan that way. And we can't bet that way. It's too, too distance a bet for a province that's in the current status in the economy to make that bet. Or do you really think that pipelines can be built in future? A lot of, a lot of people, whether, I mean, you know, it depends on which politicians you listen to, but I think, for example, C-69 described as the no more pipelines bill uh, by opponents. Um, I think some people might be surprised to hear you state that you think if market forces align, you can just build more pipelines. It seems to me to be more and more trends of, of people, communities standing up and saying, no way. I mean, pipeline opposition to me seems stronger and stronger by, by every month. Well, I would say pipelines today in this market speculating on growing production of oil, they make no sense. That's a speculation that makes no sense. Let's fast forward. You think the Gulf Coast refineries in the United States, if they were actually short of oil and actually had to short the United States market and the demand was there, you don't think the United States of America would organize to solve that problem. Same with Canada. Every time Quebec or Ontario people risk getting short of energy, a whole bunch of people jump up. But they're not short right now. There's a surplus in the market. So, so what, Art, if you were if you were advising the Alberta government, um, I mean, at some point, 
I think you've got to cut bait on Keystone XL. You, you, you can keep banging the drum, I think, to build favor with your grassroots supporters. But if it's not happening, it's not happening. What would your advice be on this file and on the bigger energy file to the Alberta government right now? Defend what we have. Stop trying to focus the Alberta economy on growing oil production. Drop it. The industry has. It's not growing oil production as an industry because the risk reward in that market makes no sense today. And Alberta doesn't have surplus capital and surplus funds or time to keep chasing growth in oil as the economic engine for Alberta. Hmm. There are way better prospects. Defend what we have. That's uh, that's the pull quote from this interview, uh, my man. Uh, let me ask you this before we go. You're you're involved in the. I don't know how you describe it, but you're kind of in the internet space right now with Axia. We, we've we've had some interesting conversations, including yesterday with Senator Doug Black, uh, telling us about how much he's hearing from rural Albertans. I don't even know if this is relevant art with what you're doing, but I'm curious for your insight, and I've got you here, so I want to ask you about it. Um, the, the lack of reliable internet, the lack of broadband, the lack of service uh, for so many Canadians, including uh, rural residents here in the Prairie provinces. Um, what's your insight on that? How does that happen? Who is it up to? Do you leave that to the free market? Should there be government investment there? Is it necessary? What's your insight? Well, uh, that's, a, that's another separate topic. But uh, I would say, you know, we had the starting of a rural Alberta uh, solution, which was called the Alberta Supernet, the company that I was the founder of and the CEO of AxiNet Media put that forward and that was created. And then under the NDP, that whole structure was basically uh, torn apart by donating that business to uh, TELUS and Bell. So the right answer for rural is to separate the infrastructure from all the rest of the stuff, like we do with power lines, like we do with uh, pipelines, put in the infrastructure and then have the market compete over the infrastructure. Hmm. So Alberta had a great start on that. It's taken a big step back because now it's back in the core of the telcos and the telcos will do their best to uh, extract money to do anything in rural Alberta. If people want to learn more about what you're doing in that space, they can check out axia.com. Uh, let me ask you an audience a question in closing here, Art. This uh, from Ryan, just to, just to cl clarify that, we had to sell Axia to Bell. Oh. So Axia is now a Bell company. My apologies, Art. Can, what are you involved in now then? Uh, I'm involved in a company called Bro Bode, right. which is a prop tech company. And of course, the Sunterra Group and a number of other private investments. Right. Thanks for the clarification so, there. I, I've got a little egg on my face right now. I can taste it here in the, in the corner of my mouth. Um, let me ask you this from, from Ytream in closing. Um, as mentioned, if you're just tuning in, if you're streaming us live audio on Mixler, this is uh, Art Price. It's with us, former CEO of Husky Energy back in the day. Um, Ytream says, I'd love to hear Art's take on oil companies and executives uh, being sued for the role that they played in contributing to climate change. Um, I don't have any sources to cite here, but that's the question from the audience. I bet you have an opinion on that. What would you, what would you say? Well, I'm actually I'm actually not aware of actual lawsuits on executives. I am aware of all kinds of challenges to boards of directors and executives. Uh, it's the government that sets the policy framework, and then the industry has to compete within it. And I agree that government should move way, the pendulum way more to a sustainable market economy from the one that we have now, which is the old industrial economy. So there needs to be a transformation. And, you know, the industry really has to play by the rules that the government set. They don't have the luxury of ignoring those rules. So on that topic, the industry, you know, the government should be moving to a sustainable market economy set of rules. That's a totally different 
tax and regulatory structure than the one we have now. That's another subject for another topic, but moving in that direction would align the private sector with these public policy outcomes instead of pitting the private sector against these uh, sustainable, socially responsible objectives. Art Price uh, is chairman of the board for Sunterra, uh, former CEO of Husky Energy. Uh, really appreciate your insight on this, Art. Thanks so much. Nice to talk to you, right? Yeah, the, the, uh, this is great. I, I just did a quick Google search, so I don't know if this is um, what our viewer is referencing. This is a, a piece from uh, the Washington Post, uh, journalist Dino Grandoni reporting that several states, uh, Connecticut, the latest state to allege wrongdoing against an oil company over global warming. Um, I'm just seeing this for the first time. States and cities scramble to sue oil companies over climate change. Uh, more than a dozen states, counties, cities from fire ravaged California. I'm just reading the report. Fire ravaged California to flood prone South Carolina, suing oil companies to hold them responsible for the damage they say their products have caused due to climate change. That's an interesting, I, first of all, I really appreciate the question. Um, and uh, boy, that's an interesting development, isn't it? Art makes a good point. I'm, I'm sort of sifting through this in my brain as we speak live, but, but he makes a good point about regulatory framework and who sets it with regards to governments. I mean, it's, it's the same sort of a thing if a government is suing uh, big tobacco. You know, you think back to if a government... If big tobacco, boy, oh boy, do I really want to open this can. If big tobacco is operating legally, um, I'm certainly not encouraging kids to smoke, but if it's a legal product, does a government, boy, we should put this out as a Twitter poll or maybe even a Y station, maybe a question of the week. Does a government have a leg to stand on when it comes to suing big tobacco or big oil or big plastic? People are going to pile on now. So, you know, screwed we'd be without plastic. Plastic is important to us. And plastic's also a huge problem. Um, Both are correct. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Plastic's hugely important and plastic's a huge problem. Um, does a government have a leg? Does a society have a leg to stand on in suing an industry that is operated legally? You're looking at, I mean, first of all, I'm I'm not a lawyer, so we'll just Put no, that on the table right now. Neither These are of us no are lawyers. legal opinions. Yeah. I, I mean, because the thing is, when you sue somebody, you have to be able to cite damages. And if a government can say to someone like Big Tobacco or Big Oil very distinctly through your lobbying practices, through your marketing practices, um, through the way that you showed your product and and quite frankly through the information you hid from the public because uh you know there's a lot of evidence now particularly talking about in the oil sector how the you know exxon's own internal research in the 80s predicted the climate crisis and yeah travis it. travis is talking about it on you the know? chat saying as early as the 70s exxon knew about climate change yeah exactly so i'm just like this is one of those cases where you can say you were untrue. You were deceitful. You you lied to the public to advance your agenda, yeah. and now there are some damages owed. Yeah. Um, whether I, that would go through, because it would be precedent setting. It would it would be worldwide precedent setting. So there's and in, in the cigarette debate. Um, Travis is on fire this morning on the chat. I, I apologize, by the way. Sometimes I I, I have to acknowledge I, I drop in on our chat and then I, then I'm back out and then we're, I'm looking at something else. We're doing an interview. So I miss a lot. I mean, there's the chat is its own animal. It's absolutely incredible what's going on. But I do notice that Travis is popping up again and again this morning. And he says, tobacco companies were sued just fine and their products are still legal. That's true. I mean, there have been multi-billion dollar settlements with big tobacco. Um, Sean says, my biggest takeaway from all this is that the UCP oil, the political theater is not anything close to reality or even the direction that industry is taking that from Sean art art knows what he's talking about, obviously. Um, oh, I mean, yeah. a, a lot of you wrote in just to say, I mean, and I noticed at the beginning, some of you were going, this is ridiculous. This is trust me. If an interview, if I perceive, and that doesn't mean I'm not listening to you real talkers. I am. Um, but if an interview is garbage, clearly evident garbage, uh, if it's made it through our filters and makes its way onto the show and it's garbage, it'll end quickly. 
Our price knows what he's talking about. It doesn't mean like sometimes the messengers will bring messages to us that maybe we don't love or agree with sometimes, but we're going to allow people to put it out there. I mean, Senator Doug Black yesterday is a classic example. Um, you know, Heavy D writes in to say that was a great interview. You know, um, I noticed that Two Beaver, I didn't have a chance. Two Beaver wanted to talk about indigenous consultation on pipeline development, which is we could do a, a week on that. Um but then wrote in later to say, thanks, Art. That was a good interview. I mean, that to me, that's really meaningful feedback. I appreciate that. So uh, if, 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 if uh, you know, if an interview resonates with you, we want to encourage you to share it around, to tell people where they can find it by subscribing to our YouTube page. And of course, by subscribing to our podcast as well. And we always want your feedback on this, whether it's the Real Talk RJ hashtag, uh, or you can send us an email. The chat is not the greatest place to, to put stuff on our radar. Because it kind of goes and then it's gone. Uh, whereas if you send us an email, blink, there, and, you there, there, blink and you miss it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Whereas, you know, in our email inbox, uh, that, that's where we're able to take more time and kind of put together. We have this working list of shows that we're, you know, of segments that we're working on. We're looking ahead to two months from now in some of our bookings. We got really fancy and put it on a Google calendar. Oh, <laughs> Sam is dragging. <laughs> Sam's dragging me kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Um, people would be like, th this is how I operate. All right. This is like, th this, these are, these are what my to-do lists look like on old hotel papers. And I have like two or three of these in my pockets and that's how I conduct myself. You save these, old hotel uh, notepads? Post-it notes. Oh, buddy. I've just, I've just moved on just a couple of years ago from, from hanging on to all the old hotel shampoos and conditioners. <laughs> I mean, they're great for camping. The camping. Either? I mean, yeah, I used to, I've... I used to think when I was not when I was a kid, but when I was like 16, 17, 18 when you're starting to prepare for life on your own, I had this vision because I grew up in a home that was very hospitable. Mm -hmm. My parents, we always had a guest room that was ready to go. My parents loved welcoming people into the home. It was, it was great. And I think we learned that from their parents who were very hospitable. So I had this vision of like, when I moved out on my own, I was going to have a guest room. Um, and, uh, and, and when people would come visit, I'd be able to put out a towel for them and have little shampoos and conditioners. That's adorable. I love so, that. You know, so especially if you were lucky enough to stay at like the W mm. or the Fairmont yeah. or somewhere, you know, and you could get like the, you know, because they would have the, uh, you know, Aveda products or something. They'd, they'd spend a little extra on the I, shampoo. I was about to say, because there's, there's a lot of hotels that I think buy the cheapest shampoo you can possibly get. Oh, you don't want to put it's, it on. Yeah. And it's, it's like sandpaper on your hair. Yes. My guest room hack, and I started doing this a while ago, is uh, I have literally in my bathroom drawer a pile of the free toothbrushes my dentist has given me still in their packaging. So if somebody happens to stay or crash in my house, I've got a fresh toothbrush to offer. Them. There you go. How many of those do you have? Uh, like probably 45. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If 45 people stay over one night and they all need a toothbrush, this got is you me. covered. This is me. I'm going through our, we're good purging the basement again. It's a, it's an ongoing exercise. And I'm trying to get rid of like, we, we have enough Christmas paper wrap. We have enough wrapping paper to, to last for 45 Christmases. We need and to. It, and if you're like us, you have nothing but Christmas wrap and nothing to wrap a birthday present. In. Yeah, that's right. Well, you just wrap it inside out or you, or you use the old comic pages, like the funnies <laughs> we used to call them in the newspaper. Nicole's probably ready to go, right? She is. She, she's sitting here going, I literally. She's Nicole sitting here going, I literally just want a three million dollar prize. I, I'm going to warn you, she's competing for best backdrop. Oh, oh, yes. She's in she's in the running. Let me Ooh, tell you, like like better than Andrew Fung. It's up there. Andrew Fung of Kim's Convenience. If you missed that on Friday, uh, you've got to see great interview. But his background was absolutely amazing, especially if you're into sneakers. Uh, we've we've nominated him. He was my first nominee to rate my Skype room. Uh, very quickly, wanted to tell you the team at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge wants to compete for your business. If you're looking to upgrade your ride in 2021 and you're thinking that maybe four wheel drive is not a bad idea, they are Alberta's go to dealers for Jeep, uh, including the fuel efficient compass the family-friendly Grand Cherokee, including the first ever seven-passenger Grand Cherokee this year, and then the Grand Wagoneer, which is Jeep's answer to the luxury SUV market. The best selection in the province at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. Go see Scott and his team there. We also want to remind you how proud we are to be partnered with the team at Dairy Queen. They reached out to us and let us know that they've got a new special for the month of February, and this is for all you lovers out there, or anybody that's just down with ice cream the dairy queens of northwest edmonton and sherwood park have their valentine's day cupid cake promotion running from now right through till february 14th it's just under 17 bucks 16.49 for a cupid cake it's a two-person shareable blizzard cake say no more 
Go see the Dairy Queens at Palisades de Mayo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road. All right, this story is awesome. This is great. Uh, you know, you can, you, can, you, can, you can feel very strongly about the work that you do, and you can say, you know what would really help would be an infusion of cash to really allow me to take my advocacy or my work to the next level. Well, environmentalist Nicole Rycroft has just been announced. It's been, it's, it's been announced like less than two hours ago. The winner... She's the executive director of Canada-based environmental nonprofit Canopy, Canopy, the winner of a $3 million U.S. grant. The Climate Breakthrough Project is where this all comes from. Nicole, we're excited to have you here on the program this morning, but I would imagine that our excitement pales in comparison to yours. Congratulations. Well, thanks, Ryan. It's great to be here. And yes, it's it's a pretty good day. And in fact, I even got punked out by my colleagues this morning. There's a red carpet that's kind of rolling down the sideway from my uh from my front door to the mailbox so Pretty when did sweet. when did you find out about i mean three million dollars u.s um uh, i mean i guess uh, depending on uh, on the magnitude of the project that you're going to tell us about is maybe either a lot or a little but but uh, in my books it's a lot how did this come about uh, well, um, I was nominated for this award a couple of years ago, actually. It's, a, it's quite an intensive uh, selection process. Um, and, uh, you know, there was uh, interviews and conversations, uh, proposals uh, to be submitted, uh, and then a very extensive reference check uh, on their part. In fact, I think the Climate Breakthrough team probably know me better than my mother at the moment. Um, but uh, the end result is this fantastic recognition, obviously, for uh, the work that we have been doing as an organization over the last 20 years uh, in transforming markets and, and uh, catalyzing solutions uh, for our climate and for biodiversity with conserving forest ecosystems. Um, and, uh, and yes, of course, uh, we're a you know, modestly resourced uh, solutions-driven NGO. And so having $3 million be infused into us over the next three years so that we can focus on really scaling uh, these next generation solutions is a game changer for us. Uh, I've just got an email from somebody that said, I love that we've just gone from talking about pipeline expansion to saving the forests and back-to-back <laughs> interviews here on Real Talk. Uh, how do you endeavor to, I mean, let me first of all ask is, uh, will you be focusing the money in, uh, in, in Northwestern Canadian forests? Where is it going? What does the project look like? How will you be using these three million U.S. dollars to save the forests? Yeah, so Canopy, uh, we're a Canadian-based NGO, but our work is global in scope. Uh, so we uh, we work to protect the world's forest species and climate and help advance frontline community rights, and that work is global in scope. Uh, we do that by harnessing the purchasing influence of the marketplace uh, to help drive uh, change through unsustainable supply chains, so the packaging, the paper, the pulp uh, supply chains, the viscose supply chain, um, and to uh, help catalyze commercial scale production of these fundamentally more sustainable and lighter footprinted next uh, generation solutions. So um, our, this uh, award is going to be dedicated to really scaling uh, as quickly as possible the commercial scale production of next generation solutions so that we can actually conserve 30 to 50 percent of the world's forest by 2030 which is what the scientific community are calling for can you take us into the future can, can you give us an idea of what next gen packaging looks like and 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 how this all happens i mean can, can you help us lay persons understand it yeah sure so uh, at the moment uh, we, uh, forests around the world, uh, there are multiple uh, pressures and threats on them. You know, there's agriculture, uh, there's uh, the expansion of, of multiple industrial kind of commodity supply chains. And it's really these industrial uh, commodities and supply chains that have the heaviest impact. Um, a large part of it uh, can be, uh, a large part of the impact on forests is to produce packaging, paper, clothing. Uh, we rely almost exclusively on forest ecosystems at the moment uh, to provide the fiber uh, for, those, um, for those products. Uh, there are 3 billion trees that disappear into packaging every year, 200 million into viscose and rayon fabric. Uh, but 
uh, there are other alternative fibers that have fantastic quality uh, of fibers um, and come at a much lighter uh, environmental footprint and then enable us to obviously to keep forest standing. So if we were to diversify the fiber basket to include agricultural residues, of which there are literally millions and millions of tons of agricultural residues, wheat straw, flax straw, rice straw, left over every year after the food grain harvest, oftentimes it's burnt, um, you know, with being from Alberta, you'll be familiar with that uh, during harvest season. Uh, Straw has excellent qualities for making packaging and paper. And so uh, basically the straw, rather than being burnt and creating pollution uh, issues, can provide a value added revenue stream for farmers, as well as obviously a really valuable alternative supply of conflict free and, and low carbon uh, input uh, so Nicole, to a pulp mill. If we're if we're uh, you know if one is coming up with an idea in the middle of the night and scribbling it down on a piece of paper, and ten is me holding the packaging in my hand made out of straw, uh, where are we right now from one to ten? Uh, we're currently at about six, seven. Wow! Next year, well, the very first uh, North American so. 10 years ago, this was still seen as a totally crazy idea. Um, and to be honest, even three years ago, it was seen as, you know, perhaps charming uh, and appropriate on a very small scale, uh, but definitely wasn't seen as a viable alternative uh, to commercial scale volumes um, for, that are currently being used and currently leading to the degradation and deforestation of forest ecosystems around the world. Uh, but the very first uh, commercial scale straw pulp mill has now been built in eastern Washington state. Uh, the very first uh, pulp mill is being built in Europe now that will take 100% of its raw material be, will be waste clothing that would otherwise degrade in landfills. Uh, so these next generation solution technologies, uh, they're not science fiction. They're here today and the technologies are improving uh, like almost month by month, you can see sort of the improvement. So yes, uh, all we have to do now is scale them. You know, I love I loved talking to innovators or researchers when passion is evident, you know, like when you talk, kind of your, there's this subtle smile when you talk and your eyes kind of light up. And do you, do you feel this? I mean, this obviously isn't just a job you show up to. Yes, no, uh, you don't. Uh, so I started Canopy 20 years ago at the kitchen table, literally with an $1,800 budget. That tends not to be something that you do just for the job of it. Um, it's because, you know, I've, I've long held a passion for our planet, um, as well as for humanity, right? Like the health of our natural world completely underpins uh, and is foundational to life on Earth. Uh, and I think this last year with COVID has really underscored uh, the importance of keeping these intact landscapes around the world standing. Um, and so there is, uh, there is an element of this work that is deeply rewarding because it's exciting to jump out of bed and work on issues that you feel really passionate about. Uh, but also this is, a turn, this is the turnaround decade for our planet. And so it's also a really exciting time to be working on these issues. Nicole, the, um, I, I, I don't want to derail the conversation, but people are just losing their minds uh, around your background and the plants behind you. And the, first of all, I mean, Sam Brooks, the producer of this show, even when, when he saw you in our waiting room, uh, our Zoom waiting room, he was just looking at me like these plants are. Is, is this your home? Is this your office? And can people are trying to identify the types of vines. Do you deserve the credit for keeping all these plants alive? Are these your plants? Do they all have a first name? Uh, where we are on first name basis. Definitely. <laughs> okay. Is this your office? Uh, no, actually I'm, I'm working out of, uh, my living room at the moment. Wow. So this is your place. It's stunningly beautiful. Um, thank you. Is, yeah. Is, is there a secret like Fatima's writing in right now and saying that her family has told her that the only plants she's allowed to bring home anymore are plastic ones. Um, do, do you have a tip for people that would like their living room to look like this before we get back on track? 
Yeah, I have a partner that's really good with plants. Okay, there you go. Yeah, okay, there you go. That's my secret too. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually remarkable at killing plants. Um, is, yeah, yeah, it's it, the whole watering thing that kind of gets me. Well, and I, I actually water too much. That's I, I love nurture. I'm, I'm, I'm like an over nurturer. I am a helicopter parent of plants. So right. what are you going to do? Um, the ag community has got to know yourself. Yeah. yeah at least I can identify my flaws or some of them anyway. Um, the ag community, I would imagine you talk about value adds. Um, you know, this is something I would imagine that's got to be exciting for a community that sees, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of fluctuation with regards to there's, I, I could never handle the, the, the great unknown of farming. And, and I would imagine here, I mean, it's, it's great to hear some of our rural listeners or at least people that, you know, that have been around the block a little bit. Tanya is watching live and says, Oh, I just love the smell of burning straw straw during harvest, but I love this idea of using it as packaging even more that from Tanya, what's been the response? What's been the buy-in? What's been the interest uh, from ag producers, including those that are watching right now? I would imagine some people are probably hearing about this for the first time. Yeah. I mean, this is a, you know, this is a economic lifeline to rural communities, right? This is an opportunity for farmers to earn money uh, on straw that they are otherwise having to pay for disposal or um, waste management with. And, you know, Alberta, the, pro the Prairie provinces are perfectly positioned to take advantage of this. I, I think just top of mind, I think in Alberta, there's roughly 7 million tons of straw uh, that's left over after the harvest every year. Um, you know, not all of that would be used, uh, obviously, you'd want to be able to maintain the organic integrity of the soils. Uh, but that, you know, that allows for, you know, at least 10 mils uh, to be built. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm realizing quickly, I'm making a list of questions and the, the list is growing longer as we talk. I'm realizing we're going to run out of time because uh, there's so many angles we can take on this, which is exciting. It just means we're going to have to circle back and have you back on the show but what's really resonating with our real talkers right now, the people that are watching this live, uh, is the idea of fast fashion, the idea of sustainable fashion, the idea of, 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 of clothing waste. And there are so many different ways to address it. We see people doing things like clothing swaps, the pop-up of vintage shops. There's more donations. I think people are being more aware of that. But, but bigger picture, uh, where do you see trends going in a perfect world? You said this next decade is a big one for the planet. Uh, what will we be doing 10 years from now with our clothing that we're maybe not doing right now? Mm, well, that is a good question. I think the whole uh, model of fashion is going to change significantly. Uh, we're, we already see it. There's uh, clothing rental uh, models. Um, you know, even some of the big companies like H&M are shifting to a membership basis uh, rather than customers coming in and specifically buying uh product, you know, week on week. Uh, and so I think those models will really uh, kick into gear and we're going to see a really significant change. Uh, I think the swaps, secondhand clothing, uh, that will all continue forth and is a really important part of the value added uh, clothing economy. And then, you know, in nature, there's no such thing as waste. Uh, and so the cycle of of clothing that is currently ending up in landfills, which about 85% of clothing ultimately ends up in landfills. Uh, I think that uh, is going to be the next generation of, or the next season's fashions. Uh, that, ma that material rather than degrading into methane is going to be fed into the state of the art, clean closed loop uh, mills like the one that's now being built in Sweden that will draw exclusively on waste textiles as the feedstock and thereby enable forests to stay standing and be conserved. Nicole, can you see, uh, I, I don't want to disrespect this plant. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have great, a great deal of respect for this plant, but do you see hemp ever getting over the hump of, uh, I see it described as such a viable, uh, as such an important plant, a plant that has so much potential for so many reasons, but but unless it's flying under my radar, I don't see it used in, in as much of a mainstream context as you might expect. Yeah, and I mean, back at the turn of the last century, hemp was really commonly used, right? Like it was used for fabric manufacturing and for paper production. And then there was a pivot and, and a shift, and then the whole uh, war on drugs has definitely you know, significantly curtailed the acreage of hemp that there is. Um, you know, we put, uh, we have a hierarchy. Uh, so recycled 
paper or recycled clothing is at the very top of that hierarchy from an environmental perspective. Um, then uh, residues, agricultural residues or byproducts of other um, uh, of systems. So wheat straw left over after the wheat harvest, hemp straw if it's left over after a hemp uh, grain harvest. Uh, I think we need to see more acreage, but from a, a properties perspective, uh, hemp is has a really valuable contribution to make uh, into the space as well. Do you... Um... How do I ask this question? You're 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 a a high ranking uh, and and prominent uh, executive um, with an environmental group in Canada. Um, if if you pay great attention to the political space, uh, you'll know that environmental groups are oftentimes, do I say, automatically in the crosshairs of some politicians because they're e easy targets. They can be um, portrayed as boogeymen. They can be perceived as enemies of existing industry vis-a-vis -vis enemies of the economy. Um, I don't even know how to frame the question. Is what I'm saying resonating with you? Do, you? do you perceive yourself, maybe even certain jurisdictions or certain geographical regions of the country, uh, to be unfairly portrayed? Uh, I think definitely uh, we are more warmly received in some rooms than others. Uh, and... Yeah, I think there is a, a misconception, like people that work within the conservation community are actually looking uh, towards how we manage our resources for the benefit of all. How do we ensure that the natural legacy that we pass on to future generations uh, is something that's vibrant uh, and supports uh, their well-being? And, and just that recognition that our relationship with the forest ecosystem starts the very moment that we're born with the first breath that we take uh, and that we can have uh, solutions alongside, we can have a vibrant economy and we can have lifestyles that feel interesting and meaningful uh, without having a degraded planet. Um, and so I think, it, you know, uh, what was very common uh, in meeting rooms within Canada, uh, say, you know, 10 years ago is really shifting. I think people are just really aware that we have a climate crisis and we have a biodiversity crisis and the timeline, like the stopwatch is ticking. Uh, and so with that, uh, and most environmental organizations do come to the table with solutions uh, that it's opening up uh, interesting conversations and, and starting to shift that reception. Well, and, and to state the obvious, anytime that you can put a, a viable economic opportunity in front of people, you know, in other words, to say we're talking about transitioning, but here's what this can look like. Um, and, and, and here, once you start even introducing words like profit or investment or mm -hmm. promise, uh, then I think it captures people's attention. Um, absolutely different people for different reasons. Uh, Nicole, I'm already looking forward to our next conversation. Um, I can't imagine what it feels like, uh, to win a $3 million grant. Um, feels pretty great to be awarded that. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's such a, an, a testament to the work that you have been doing and we can't wait to see what you'll do with it. What's something that each of us can do today? to help save the forests or to make a tangible impact with regards to our own footprint? What's one thing we can do today? One thing. Uh, well, it all starts with reduce. Um, so I think it's, you know, simple things that each of us individually can do. Make sure we take that uh, cloth bag with us to the grocery store. If you are buying something, make sure it's got as much recycled content in it as possible. Um, and, you know, less than 5% of philanthropic giving goes to the environment. So if you know a great environmental organization that's working uh, in your area, then um, write them a check. There you go. Well, people can find you at canopyplanet.org. Uh, people can learn more about the Climate Breakthrough Project at climatebreakthroughproject.org. Um, our guest, Nicole Rycroft, uh, founder, executive director of Canopy and one of two recipients of that $3 million U.S. grant announced just about two hours ago, just this morning. Thanks for your time and, and congratulations again. Yeah, thanks so much, Ryan. You bet. Um, thanks to those of you real talkers that have been chiming in uh, here. I mean, I, it's to me, it's exciting to start thinking about these things. And I, and I think that that's one of the most important questions to ask is what's something we can do right now. 
Um, you remember this is where the prime minister kind of stepped in one a while ago. Uh, it was a reporter that asked a pretty simple question. And forgive me for not remembering the exact context, Sam, but it, the, the federal government was announcing something to do with the environment. And, and a reporter said, what's something that you and your family have done to lessen your environmental impact or to decrease, you know, to, 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 you know, lessen your footprint. And it was really telling. And, you know, you kind of, I think everyone's at some point in their life has been in that position that Justin Trudeau was in, but not everybody's the prime minister of Canada, put on the spot. You remember that yeah. when he, when he ummed and odd, and then he started trying to describe the boxed water thing. Um, and it just exploded. <laughs> yeah. The, oh, the boxed water thing. I, well, also, box, boxed water is just a very strange thing in my <laughs> mind. Like, it's this phenomenon that kind of appeared at grocery stores. And was like, well, wh- why do we have boxed water now? That's Because people will buy it. Well, That's why yeah, we have it. Because people just, will buy we it. We also have tap water, dude. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's, what's something that you've done? To you lessen know, your environmental yeah, footprint. I'm, I mean, first of all, I, I care a lot about this and I try to learn stuff as much as possible. So like educating myself, I think, is a very, very, very big one. I've been focusing a lot lately on um, learning about what recycling actually does and the fact that, you know, plastic recycling is, is kind of a giant lie that we tell ourselves. And, you know, more sustainable packaging is things like metals and plastics and, and, and whatnot. So I think it starts with, you know, trying to trying to not buy products that are overpackaged, trying to, to, you know, even just little things like uh, at the grocery store instead of the plastic produce bags, I bring mesh bags that are reusable. You know what I mean? Um, things like that. Uh, buying more. But imagine things- if that means that you you cut back the need for 10 plastic bags every time you go grocery shopping. Like, yeah, that's, exactly. That's a that's- big deal. It's other little things like, okay, when you go to the, the produce section of the grocery store and you need to buy something like one onion, do you put it in a plastic bag? Right. Because I stopped doing that. I was yeah. just like, why, why am I putting this onion in a bag? It makes no sense. Makes no sense. Uh, that and I think the other thing is we, we cut all plastic Tupperware out of our house. We bought uh, Pyrex reusable glass ones. They're great because they have, they're have they nearly vacuum sealed and you can pop, like literally take your leftovers out of the fridge and pop them straight into the oven. It's great. Yeah. So just trying to find little things to... To reduce the amount of you know overconsumption on packaging, uh, uh, reduce the amount of stuff. I'm big picture things would really love to see some solar rebates like come into place so that I can retrofit my house. Uh, I wish I had the Kubi Energy yeah. spot to read right now. I could I could exactly. remind you that it's, it's, the city of oh, Edmonton will give you four grand percent on my radar. Yeah, there you go. Uh, buddy. I've been I've been looking into it for a couple of years now. Have you? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah that we, we can talk about. I mean, the, the whole solar thing, man, we could do it. Maybe we'll do a whole show on that one day. Um, I love this. Um, I already apologize. I'm going to say Eris. I already know I'm mispronouncing Eris's name on the live chat. It says I see most environmentalists as some of the most bright and hopeful people. Um, they're, they're not doomsaying. They're offering solutions. Um, you know, this is uh, yeah, I'm just reading through the chat. It's, it's some interesting comments here. Uh, Mark says, you know, conservation has become a dirty word in a world concerned with disposable items, and it's time to change that. It's crazy if you think of of how our grandparents treated, you know, the purchase of appliance appliances versus how we treat the purchase of appliances. If you're they're if you're, disposable now, if your microwave or your yeah. I was going to say Bluetooth player. Did people even? Yeah, but whatever. Whatever Back you have. when our parents bought their Bluetooth <laughs> record players. But Bluetooth, I mean, you can go get a Bluetooth now. I know because I went and bought one for our for our cabin, for my garage, uh, to play old surf videos. They're like 40 bucks. Yeah. You know, a new microwave is like 90 bucks. I mean, people just toss the old ones. I, and you know what? And that's something that I didn't really even mention. And, and this is just because it's very second nature to me is, you know, I try to repair things as much as possible or strip them for parts if I can't. Like Not I everybody have, is Sam Brooks. I, so. I have I literally have drawers in my garage of, you know, broken down electronics that I know have valuable parts in them if I have to fix something later, which is yeah, like granted not accessible to everybody, but it is something that yeah, I I will repair or try and build something myself first before running to a store. And I have drawers in my garage of duct tape and rolling papers so between the two of us we're ready for there you go whatever the world throws yep. at us um cameron says if we're using agricultural land for growing these items what does that mean for food are we robbing from one area for another you know are we robbing peter to pay paul especially on a global level wonders cameron terry i love this from terry she says i hope that more people uh, or she's i love that more people planted gardens this year and i hope that the trend continues that's a great point 
Um, Michael says, know your five R's. Refuse. Reduce. That's a good, that's a good one to start off with. With refuse, I like that one. Uh, the live chat just jumped ahead on me and kind of screwed me over as I went to read Michael's. You I think- guys, you guys are going nuts here on the chat. It's great. Refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, and rot. Compost. That makes sense. Compost. Yeah. I saw. I saw the. Um, what was it? The environmental group in uh, uh, Canada. Who was it? Uh, anyway, one of the big ones had sent out a note. They said that w- they want you to treat your Christmas. Tree. If you had a live Christmas tree, they want you to treat it differently this year. They want you to lay it down flat, like lay it down on its side in the garden and drill a bunch of holes hmm. through the trunk. And then they said it will slowly compost and work its way into your garden. I thought it was kind of funny because in my mind, that's like about a 15 to 20 year process. Yeah, that's like watching, the timeline is what bothers me. Because right now my Christmas tree is dead laying in my backyard and my dog plays with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We're just waiting for a big spring bonfire. And eventually, yeah, and eventually it'll be firewood. <laughs> waiting for a big pallet fire. Yeah, exactly. Um, I love this email. I just got this from Ralph. I wanted to read this. Ralph says, as I'm watching Real Talk, I wanted to share this quote with my fellow audience members. Whenever a child learns critical thinking somewhere... A conspiracy theory dies. Ralph says maybe T-shirts should be made up and sent to our local politicians. I love that. Um, we're going to be talking to Chrissy Stroop in just a second. Uh, we're going to. This show just keeps going, <laughs> taking different off ramps and completely changing the subject. And I love it. We're going to talk about American and Canadian evangelicals and the political intersections and non-compliance with mask orders. And, and we're going to get into it in, in, in a courageous way. And I know that it will not resonate with everybody, but we want to have meaningful conversations. And, and, and resoundingly, Real Talkers demanded that we get Chrissy Stroop on the show. So I'm looking forward to talking to her in just a second. I wanted to remind you that right now is a perfect time to reach out to the team at Eden Lab landscaping i don't speak for them but i can guarantee you that their inspiration goes far beyond laying your christmas tree down on its side drilling holes in the trunk and watching it decompose in fact they have a very different vision for what your back or front yard space can look like they've been doing it for more than 20 years and their work is fabulous it speaks for itself landscape edmonton.ca you can check it out uh you can link to the any of our sponsors under the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com right now they're using zoom like everybody else and google earth which is a great idea to be able to take a look at your property and scale up what might be a pretty visionary plan for how you can maximize your own space. Check out the team at Eden Landscaping in business for more than 20 years. The team at Alta Moving and Storage, uh, I mean, this is they're telling us, they reach out to us and they say it's been amazing to hear from real talkers that are trusting them with your move. They know that it can be a stressful process and they built their business on taking the stress out of it. They work with you with these pod style containers to make sure that you have it for as long as you need and the process is custom tailored to what your family or what your personal circumstance calls for. You can find the team at Alta Moving and Storage, including long and short-term storage solutions online, again, under the Sponsors tab on our website. This conversation, I think, is going to be a good one. Matter of fact, I know for a fact it's going to be uh, Chrissy Stroop and I have been chatting for a while. Um, Chrissy is an ex-evangelical writer, a speaker, an advocate focused on religion, politics, and, and sometimes even foreign policy, uh, holding a, a PhD in modern Russian history from Stanford universities. Uh, Chrissy's taught in universities around the world, uh, including Russia, Florida, the United States. You've probably read her work in the Boston Globe, in Playboy, in The Conversationalist, and other outlets. Uh, she's the founder of a couple pretty prominent hashtags, uh, including Exposed Christian Schools, uh, as well as empty the pews. And it's a real pleasure to welcome Chrissy Stroop to Real Talk. Thanks for making time for us this morning and welcome to the show. Chrissy, I think maybe you might be on mute. So let us know as soon as we're ready to sort it out, ready to go, and we'll get it sorted. Um, Sam, I can get into an email here. Oh, there we go. Chrissy, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. We were working on it just before Chrissy came live. Are we good to go? Can Chrissy, you hear me okay, hear Chrissy? 
Sam, I'm going to let you work okay, on it. I'm going to get good. to an email. Yep. We'll sort this out uh, behind the scenes. Um, first question is going to be, what does it mean to be an ex-evangelical? How does that come about? Uh, we'll get to that conversation in just a moment. Peter I wanna, talks to his you, computer. He prefers it to typing and particularly prefers it Sam, to Sam, I'm paper. hearing uh, something crazy going on in my... Uh, okay, this is doesn't matter. This is live. This is what happens with the live show recording. Um, questions uh, and, and comments are coming in on past interviews here to talk at ryanjesperson.com, including some past interviews here. And I really appreciate this from Krista, who took the time to be in touch with us yesterday following our body image roundtable. If you missed that, it was a remarkable conversation, and I want to encourage you to check it out. Krista wrote in to me and said those ladies that you had on the show were so wonderful, uh, so insightful, and I appreciated hearing a conversation on body image from different areas and perspectives. Said, I recently got really angry, and it's bolded and in all caps, really angry about eating disorders and the diet culture. And I decided that I desperately wanted to make a difference in our community in some way. So I don't quite know what that is, but, but I thought I'd write into the show. Well, it caught my attention. Chris, I appreciate it. So, it says, as a woman who recently turned 50 and who has struggled with my weight and with an eating disorder for most of my life, I want to say that this conversation needs to continue and it really needs more attention in so many areas, politically, in the medical community, in schools and otherwise. Uh, So through the Eating Disorder Support Network of Alberta, I stumbled upon a, a support group for women over 40 and it changed my life. Krista says, I think there's a huge misunderstanding. I was guilty of it myself. That eating disorder is like a, you know, it it would portray itself as as a tiny young person uh, living with anorexia or or a person with bulimia. Uh, Krista says that's not true. Uh, People, including our doctors, need to better understand what eating disorders are and that they can they can manifest themselves in any body size and at any age. Until the last few months, I never even labeled myself, says Krista, as a person with an eating disorder. I called myself a professional dieter. And my friends and family just knew they would come to expect that, that, that I would either be on one crazy diet or another. Society has placed so much value on our body image and has been perpetuating and idealizing this diet culture, and I'm tired of it. I've wasted years of my life uh, missing out on birthday cakes and pizza. I've paid enormous amounts of money, uh, typically that I couldn't even afford, for expensive diets and personal trainers, and I've been very successful doing so at the cost of my mental and emotional well-being. Society praised me when I lost weight, which just keeps people on this dangerous roller coaster. What people don't understand is that eating disorders are cloaked in secrecy and shame, and they can completely overwhelm somebody's life. Where's the support for for a 35-year-old man or woman that's binging and purging? You know, what resources exist to help the average person, and there are many of us, stop the cycle of dieting and self-harm. Krista says, after spending my entire life beating myself up, I've gotten angry as hell at what society has done and angry with myself for buying into it. You can't turn on the TV without being bombarded with diet ads. I get phone calls and emails and brochures from diet centers that I've been a member at. So here's my question. If I went on a diet and I lost the weight, why are these companies contacting me again? Why? Because they know that diets fail and they prey on our vulnerabilities and our insecurities and they profit from them. They they have repeat clients because diets don't work because if they did, they wouldn't be in business. Krista says, I recently compared it to this. If I was an alcoholic and I, and I quit drinking and I went to AA and I got myself in a healthy place, would a liquor store call me? And tell me that they miss me and they want me to come back and that they have a deal for me? It's absurd. She says, doctors telling people they need to lose five pounds, they need to consider how their words are received and and that they could actually be shaming people and contributing to an eating disorder epidemic. Says, I'm not talking about obesity or major health concerns, but I know that some people that that I'm aware of that I would characterize as skinny have been told by their doctors to lose a couple pounds. Why? How do we get this to stop? says in closing, how, how do we change society's beliefs on body shape and weight? How do we teach our kids that size doesn't matter and that they're important no matter what their scale says? She says, this from Krista says, in January, I actually literally took a sledgehammer to my scale. After having my life controlled by my scale or allowing me or, or me allowing it to be that way, I've had enough. 
says, now I have to deal with this eating disorder. I ha- I ha- I'm on a journey to learn to love my body and to have a healthy relationship with food in a way that I've never had before. Thank God I found my support group. I think we need to continue this conversation and the topic needs to be just as important as other mental health issues. Thank you for the conversation on Real Talk. I hope that it gave people hope and inspiration. Then signs off with a P.S., says, for some reason, I feel compelled to share my most personal thoughts on this topic. Maybe, maybe because I'm done hiding. Maybe because I'm no longer ashamed to say I have an eating disorder. That from Krista. Absolutely incredible to receive an email like that. Thank you for taking the time to type that out to us. Thank you for sharing and thank you for, I know, uh, presenting a message that will resonate with our audience. Let's get back to the creator of Empty the Pews. It's a hashtag that's trended on Twitter. Uh, Chrissy Stroop, welcome to Real Talk. And thanks for your patience as we sorted out all the tech stuff. Uh, Hi, Ryan. Thanks so much for having me. And I I should be thanking you for your patience. Uh, Yesterday, I had kind of a computer disaster. And so I am using my roommate's computer. (laughs) Well, we are all sorted. And here we are. And uh, the sky's the limit for this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. When I started asking um, what I believe is a fair question, um, as you pay attention, I I googled pastor no masks or church no masks. You'll get more (laughs) more than 100 million returns on on Google of, of, of evangelical communities in particular um, that are defying mask orders. I see it in our own backyard here in Alberta. You see it in your home country of the United States. Um, Mm -hmm. I could not ignore the number of people that said you have to get Chrissy Stroop on the show to talk about this. Why do you think so many people are nominating you? (laughs) Well, uh, that's very kind of them. And I really appreciate that, uh, that demand. Uh, I think it may be because there is is not as much commentary uh, on the Christian right in, in Canada as maybe there there is for the United States. I mean, there are some really smart Canadian scholars like Andre Gagne, who um, is a pretty frequent guest on television and radio news. Um, but I think that we're just kind of really beginning to explore both in Canada and the United States, the connections across the border uh, between evangelicals and the Christian right. And it's become a more urgent question, you know, with respect to uh, recent developments in Canadian politics, and particularly in Alberta. So, um, you know, I want to thank all of my Alberta and and, um, Canadian uh, Twitter followers. And uh, thanks to everybody who asked me to be on this show. I think it's important to have these kinds of discussions, and and also to trace the international connections. Um, There's definitely some, you know, quite a few networks um, that cross borders. Is it fair is it a fair question uh, for me to associate uh, hesitance around mass compliance, um, observance of, 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 of health orders and laws? Is it fair for me to invoke religious communities in asking this question? There was, there was, I, I knew there'd be blowback uh, when I tweeted about it. I said that I know that some of you are going to be upset by me asking this question, but, but I felt like I can't ignore it. Um, what's your take on the fairness of the question? I think it is a perfectly fair and valid question to ask precisely because we're seeing uh, so many pastors refusing to uh, implement public health measures at their churches, actually filing lawsuits. I'm not sure about in in Canada, but certainly in the United States, there have been quite a few lawsuits uh, in in California, for example, where, where some people might not expect it just based on the reputation of the state, but they're invoking religious freedom right, in order to say that they have the right, basically, to ignore uh, public health, to reject public health laws, to accept conspiracy theories instead, and thus to spread a deadly pandemic. Uh, That is highly antisocial behavior. And if you're going to couch it, uh, if you're going to try to justify it in terms of religious freedom, then talking about religion has to be on the table. I do think when we talk about uh, Christianity or religion in these contexts, we need to talk about it in nuanced and targeted ways. So, of course, there are many churches, I think probably even most churches that would identify as broadly evangelical in in the United States that uh, have gone to virtual Sunday services, you know, uh, or implemented other public health measures. But clearly there are quite a few that have not. They have been traced to um, outbreaks. And so it's, it's it's a serious issue. There's there's no one else. There's no other source of authority that's being seriously invoked besides vaguely the constitution right to to justify 
this behavior. Um, where they're really trying to make it uh, a constitutional issue is precisely via religious freedom. And so we need to talk about, I think, what religious freedom means or, or what it should mean, because to Christian supremacists, which um, you know most evangelicals are, they don't really accept pluralism. They think everyone uh, should believe the kinds of things that they believe, or they deserve to go to hell, and they will go to hell. Um, and, and they're not good with really dealing with people who aren't like them in, in the public square. You know, those kinds of beliefs make make someone ripe for conspiracy theories. They're afraid of outsiders. They're afraid of, quote unquote, big governments. Um, and, uh, and we need to look at, you know, how tolerant of such intolerance it's possible to be without causing serious damage to the, the rest of our countries and civil society. Chrissy, this is uh, a, a fair question uh, from a viewer watching live right now. Some random guy uh, is the handle. That's not how I'm referring to him. <laughs> some, some random guy says, hey, this is an honest question. Um, but is this a trend that only really happens with evangelical Christians? I mean, do we see this kind of frequency in other religious denominations? Um, let me say that uh, I, I had a, a bunch of people reach out to me, including very close personal friends that said, hey, you know, some of them said, I'm a little disappointed that you're saying this about Christians. Others said, hey, I just want to tell you a good news story about about the steps our church has taken. Many churches have gone exclusively online. Many churches are absolutely, we had Reverend Anna Greenwood on a couple of weeks ago talking about her church and, and her online sermons. And, 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 you know, people are sort of saying, you know, not all churches, basically. Other people have pointed out, you know, saying, hey, we've seen Diwali celebrations that have seen mass gatherings. We, we've, we've, we've seen, you know, Muslim popu populations, uh, Muslim Canadians gathering. They said, Ryan, you don't have the balls to talk. You don't have the stones to talk about that. You know, you're, <laughs> you're afraid of being called a racist, so you don't, you don't have the stones to talk about, you know, people worshiping it in Islamic communities. Um, what do you read into that? Well, you know, when you want to talk about um, various religious communities in countries like the United States and Canada, uh, there's really only one broadly defined religious group that enjoys something like hegemony and, and cultural privilege, and, and that would be Christians, and uh, in, in particular, white Christians. Um, so we can certainly talk about other, other uh, issues where they may come up. In the United States, I can give you an example. Uh, while the, the vast majority of, of Jewish communities, for example, have uh, gone to, uh, you know, solutions where they don't meet uh, in public at the synagogue, you know, some ultra Orthodox Jews in, in and around New York City have defied mask orders, and there's been some some coverage of that. But when we talk about other religious groups, we do need to keep in mind power dynamics, which groups are more powerful uh, than than others, and also things like you know, if you want to talk about Muslims, I don't have the Canadian numbers off the top of my head, but last day I checked in the U.S., Muslims represent about one percent of of the population. Christians are still in the 70s. Um, so, you know, what's going to have ultimately a, uh, a, a bigger impact on, on public health? Uh, sure, everyone should be obeying public health measures. But if you want to talk about who's fighting the public health measures, uh, who's doing the most damage by spreading conspiracy theories and filing lawsuits and so forth, I mean, it absolutely is Christians. And of course, it's not all Christians. I mean, I said that myself in my first answer to your question that uh, most churches are complying, but the ones that, that are not are being, uh, you know, not just very loud about it, but they're, they're causing huge problems. I mean, there's this really awful church uh, in, in California, Bethel Redding, um, where, you know, there's this, there's this worship leader, Sean Foyce, who's been organizing these big rallies outside of church. He's been going to, uh, to Black Lives Matter protests and kind of on the outskirts trying to convert people to Christianity. And he's actually doing things like selling t-shirts that say Jesus Christ super spreader, um, which is a, not a very appropriate thing to joke about, I don't think. But, you know, he's, he's kind of saying, you know, come at me, bro, or, um, you know, come and take it, or th this is this is no big deal. Um, so it's, it's, it's really on that scale, it's only a problem with Christians, and yes, it's not all Christians, it's not all churches, but they're the ones who have the power to make a religious freedom argument in the, in the public square, and uh, I don't see, well, let's just say that's that's what we need to address. Where do you, where do you see evangelicalism going? <laughs> this is, I'm just realizing the magnitude of the question I'm asking you. I don't know how much time you have, Chrissy, but... <laughs> 
you know, I look at I look at some of the pillars. I mean, I I'm, I'm pretty sure you grew up in the church. I'm happy to share my experience with you and oh, have, yeah. you, have you share yours with mine. I attended a private Christian school um, from preschool to grade nine. I went to public high school. I went to a, a Bible college. I have a diploma in theology. I went to a private Christian university. I speak from a position of experience. I can speak the language. Um, uh, so and it influences my perspective in a lot of areas. Um, I grew up revering Billy Graham. Um, and when I see now his son, Franklin Graham, and just the, the unconscionable support for former President Donald Trump and, and some of the messages that, that I'm just picking one example, one example um, of, of what Franklin Graham has come to represent. And in my mind, how he has, in my mind, betrayed uh, supporters and, and betrayed, uh, betrayed followers of, of Samaritan's Purse. And of, in my mind, I think, I guess I'm, I'm trying not to be too harsh in my indictment, but I just think he's, I mean, he seems to me to be doing almost the work of the Antichrist, quite frankly. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's I mean, what I, that's what I'm stopping. I mean, my, my fucking show is called Real Talk. I might as well bring some real talk to the table. Um, I just he, he feels to he strikes me as the Antichrist in the work that he's doing right now in leading people to support someone as 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 morally uh, be, bereft as Donald Trump. Um, where does evangelicalism go in the United States and in Canada and around the world? Uh, how does how does it recover from Trumpism if it does? Um, how do how do church congregations how do how do leaders of those flocks begin to earn back the trust of the people in the pews? Where do you see this going? I mean, in my mind, it's facing a major crisis right now. Do you agree or disagree? Well, I think that it is facing a crisis to to some degree. But the whole point of evangelicalism is that you get to constantly be in crisis. You get to constantly be persecuted, and you enjoy moral superiority from that. I mean, they they will create crises if they don't have a crisis. And when they talk about, you know, youth leaving the church, uh, which is, you know, what the hashtag empty the pews is, is kind of about, although it's not just for youth, but really the idea was to say, look, your bigotry, your support for Donald Trump, you are going to lose members, you are losing members. Um, usually they don't address that crisis in a, in a serious way, right? Because they can't actually listen to people like me who have just given up on um, religion altogether or that would seriously uh, threaten their faith. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of deflection and projection and whataboutism in, in those communities. There certainly are some evangelicals who I call respectable evangelicals, but I call them that with a, with a certain irony because I generally think that they enable uh, the extremists and are part of the problem because basically they share the same, the same theology, the same uh, absolutely radical views on wanting to ban all abortion. Uh, the same anti-science views. But now, you know, people like Ed Setzer at Christianity Today, by the way, he heads the Billy Graham Center there. Um, people like David French, you know, they're, they're wringing their hands and they're saying, evangelicals, please stop believing conspiracy theories. When honestly, they themselves believe conspiracy theories if they think that, you know, life begins at conception or any abortion is murder, because obviously that would make God the biggest abortionist of all, right? I mean, I mean, most fertilized eggs don't don't end up leading to, uh, you know, fully viable pregnancies. Um, so they also support these kinds of Christian schools that you and I went to. I went to um, Christian schools. Uh, the, they're usually just called Christian schools or Christian academies in the United States. Many of them began their lives as um, explicitly segregation academies, white Christian schools that were set up to uh, avoid integration when integration was being uh, pushed through by, by the government um, in, in conjunction with um, civil rights legislation and Supreme Court decisions. Uh, so, so when the government was you know, promoting integration and um, requiring integration as it should have, we started forming these, these um, segregation academies and justifying them on the grounds of religious liberty. That's the background for, for these kinds of schools. Uh, so I went to one of those first through half of sixth grade, and that's when we moved from Indiana to Colorado. Uh, and then second half of sixth grade, I was back in a Christian school in Colorado, uh, then back to a Christian school for high school. But then I did go to a state university from there and to a private secular university, Stanford, for graduate school. So I kind of got out of that evangelical uh, education system. Anyway, people like Ed Setzer and, um, you know, uh, David French, Michael Gerson, um, Russell Moore, I suppose I would say, we're talking about American evangelicals. He's the head of the Southern Baptist Convention's 
public policy arm, and that is the largest Protestant denomination in the United States, they see the church as, as in a crisis. But I think that the solutions they offer are always going to fall short. And um, that most evangelicals actually, where do they go? They go behind Franklin Graham. They love Franklin Graham. And I would argue that Franklin Graham has not fallen far from the tree of Billy Graham at all. Billy Graham believed that, you know, public uh, political meetings should open with prayer. Um, he railed against communism uh, as, a, as a threat to Christianity. Um, he... He was pretty hardline in the fifties, and but he, isn't but, but communism was bad for Christianity, and and I don't is, I mean but, sure. and for a faith leader <laughs> for a faith leader to want to open political meetings with prayer, I mean you know the, the guy probably got paid one hundred fifty grand to go pray in front of a bunch. Of, that's that's kind of his that's his convict. I don't know if I necessarily see that. Like I'll be honest, Chrissy, my recollection of Billy Graham having you know I saw him live at McMahon Stadium when I was a young kid and this that and the other in Calgary, but but again I have the perception and the memory of a child, so I mm -hmm. I, I can't say that I've evaluated. Billy Graham's relationship with with President Ford or President Reagan, I, I can't I can't get into that. I'm I could I, I could do the background research, but I he just never struck me as much of a jerk as his son. <laughs> well, I do think he was less of, less of an overt jerk, but I also think that he was what uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King called the white moderate in his scathing letter from a Birmingham jail uh, that that he wrote to denounce uh, the people who would not, you know, get behind demands for civil rights now. Sure, Billy Graham integrated some of his, some of his crusades. Um, and, he, and he once bailed Martin Luther King out of jail. But to claim that they were friends uh, is quite a stretch because after that, Billy Graham really started to pull back from the civil rights movement and say, okay, 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 you're, you're moving too fast. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, on the anti-communism, I, I should say it was a sort of radical kind of anti-communism where he said he the, the flip side of that is that he preached the only solution is for everyone to turn to Jesus Christ. That's going to solve our social problems. No kind of so like social ideology or politics can solve our problems. Only only Jesus, which, again, is an anti-pluralist position. And so it's just not that big of a step uh, to Franklin Graham to, you know, really just double down on this kind of radicalism. Billy Graham seemed to have moderated some over time, but he certainly was still anti-pluralist. He certainly still believed that only Jesus Christ was going to be a solution ultimately to racism, to war, and to the world's problems um, as he preached very in a very fiery way in the 1950s and maybe in a somewhat less fiery way later. I, I did hear him myself when he was already quite old in, in 1999. Um, he came through Indianapolis, and I was... Uh, a senior at Heritage Christian School in Indianapolis at that time. Uh, our school encouraged us to volunteer at the Billy Graham Crusade. Now it's true that some uh, fundamentalists who are even, you know, more to the right of evangelicals don't like Billy Graham because they see him as too liberal. So, you know, I had a friend in youth group um, who was homeschooled for a while and then went to even a more extreme Christian school. And I talked to a friend in college as well who went to this other extreme Christian school called Colonial Christian School. And they basically forbade their students from volunteering yeah colonial at, can you um, imagine going to like <laughs> calling it can you imagine opening a school this year and calling it colonial christian school that uh i mean maybe it's still there that. yeah it's, it's uh so you know they're not changing the name but um it's uh yeah they forbade their students from volunteering with billy graham because they saw him as uh too too liberal too nice to to muslims and jews and so forth too nice to that heretic martin luther king um but, you know, I, I kind of still am pretty critical of Billy Graham from the left. I don't think most supporters of Samaritan's Purse or the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association at this point feel betrayed by him. Um, I mean, I hope those that do would uh, stop supporting those organizations. I suppose that there are probably a number of mainline churches that still donate shoeboxes for Operation Christmas Child, which is a very uh, right-wing Christian colonialist enterprise, find better ways to, you know, support uh, people in poverty than Operation Christmas Child, certainly don't support Franklin Graham in any of his endeavors. Uh, but I think a number of churches, even somewhat more moderate to liberal ones, at least used to do Operation Christmas Child. Some of those people, the more moderate to liberal people who maybe did Operation Christmas Child may feel betrayed now, but most white evangelicals in the United States, they don't feel betrayed at all. This is who they are. Uh, Christy Stroop is our guest, uh, the founder of a, a couple of hashtags that have, that have certainly gleaned a lot of attention, including empty the pews and expose Christian schools. 
Um, you, you, you've talked about your upbringing. You've talked about attending uh, Christian schools. Um, you, you were very open with me in our email correspondence ahead of time. You said, I'm more than happy to talk about my gender transition if you want to. Um, you've had a hell of a journey. Um, I mean, you know, how, how much of, of your uh, activism and how much of your public awareness, I mean, the writing that you do, um, you know, people can check out your book as well. How much of that is, is based on your personal experience? Uh, how much of this is an intellectual or academic exercise? I've got some really interesting comments here on our on our live chat. Shalane, for example, is watching this morning. She says, I'd be interested in a poll of how many people from religious families and backgrounds are now agnostic or atheist compared mm-hmm. to somebody growing up without religion becoming religious. How much of this is personal for you? Well, of course, it's all it's all very personal, and it's it's hard to answer your question in any sort of direct way. I don't think I can go into my mind with a, a measuring tape and, and get you some, some data on this. But in fact, there's I think nothing particularly exceptional about about that because what I I'm, I've been reading, you know, just in the popular press. So take it with a grain of salt about cognitive science in, in recent years is that we've come to understand that all reasoning is motivated. There's really no such thing as pure uh, reason. And facts do not change people's minds when they're deeply emotionally invested in a particular position that they hold. I would certainly say that in my case, it's all connected. My struggles with the the Christianity that that I grew up with and that kept me from even realizing that I was queer until age 33 uh, I, I'm now 40 because there simply was no intellectual toolkit for that, right? I had to sort of deconstruct the faith, deal with the faith crisis, and then figure out what was going on underneath, although I always felt different somehow and off as a child, and I just couldn't quite put my finger on how. And looking back, it's easy to see a lot of gender things there uh, that, that spoke to that. Um, but, you know, my coping mechanism from feeling different and feeling like I wasn't just like a fish in water swimming through life, like it seemed like everyone else was, but I had to just kind of step back and observe. Um, That caused me to become a very cerebral child. And and, and so I then excelled academically, even in this highly ideological indoctrinating environment. And I was lucky and privileged that, you know, the kind of Christian school that I graduated from um, does uh, qualify for college prep. Uh, It it does have some what they call advanced placement courses. I don't know if that's also a thing in Canada, but the AP courses allow you to get college credit for um, courses that you take in high school that are supposed to be equivalent to introductory college courses. So this created a lot of cognitive dissonance for me, right? Because I did learn uh, to write well, to formulate uh, my thoughts in the form of an argument and uh, to communicate well. And, and to think critically, but we were taught logical fallacies, for example, how to identify them, but you were only supposed to use that for apologetics, for the purposes of defending the faith. Yeah. And, and, th- and this very particular, very strict version uh, of the faith where you had to believe in things like the virgin birth and young earth creationism. Yeah, six I day, think, the world created in six days, the world 7,000 years old. I mean, absolutely. I took AP biology in Christian school. We actually did a lab with recombinant DNA where we tried to, uh, you know, get this bacteria colony to glow under a black light. Um, And our teacher, he literally told us we had to use a basic college textbook, right? A real secular college textbook in order to qualify for AP. Um, The the basic biology textbooks that were from, uh, you know, Christian publishers that we used in the first biology class were a joke, but AP biology, we had a college textbook. And and this uh, teacher who would also often open his classes with what he called a thought, which would be this long, like rambling devotional. And it was often quite apocalyptic. Um, He told us that he would not teach us the the, uh, evolution chapters because he could not in good conscience do so. And he showed us videos. I hesitate to call them documentaries, though they certainly thought of themselves that way. Uh, teaching us about young earth creationism and so-called flood geology, right? How if you just look at the, um, you know, the fossils and the the rock layers and so forth uh, through the lens of Noah's flood, it explains everything. You don't have to have evolution. You don't have to have geologic time. Um, So this nonsense, right? But he told us, go read those evolution chapters at home on your own, regurgitate them for the exam. Tell them what they, they want you to, to say. 
basically on the evolution questions on the exam, um, which was a big part of the exam because evolution is the foundational theory of modern biology, right? So, yeah. um, so you basically said lying for Jesus is okay because the, the whole idea was, I, I would say I was on the elite culture warrior track, right? There are the, the sort of um, fly-by-night church schools and, and Bible colleges where it's really hard to um, move on from, from those to any kind of secular education, uh, and that's by design, but there are also these schools that try to, to put people into, you know, highly placed professional positions, prepare them to be doctors, lawyers, entrepreneurs, um, maybe professors at Christian colleges, that, that sort of thing, write books, debate, quote unquote, evolutionists. I, I was on that track, which is lucky for me because again, I got to read a lot. I got to think a lot. I was easily able to get into um, a state college, state university with, um, with a great academic scholarship. To be in the world, Chrissy, but not of the world, right? Exactly. That's the, the lingo. And, you know, there's a whole lot of debates about what exactly uh, that means in, in evangelical world. Um, but yeah, so I come from this kind of middle class to upper middle class evangelical milieu. And actually most of Trump's uh, supporters uh, are not poor white people. They're middle class and up white Christian Americans who are invested in Christian nationalism. Um, yeah, which was so it, it allowed me to kind of eventually think my way out because I wasn't the kind of person that actually has any right to exist in this uh, ideology. And so I spent many years, even before I could fully articulate why, considering myself, and this is, I mean, I thought of myself directly this way. I'm quoting myself from 20 years ago, thinking of myself as an impossible person who shouldn't exist. I had suicidal ideation frequently. Uh, and yeah, I just, there, I, evangelicalism doesn't, doesn't accommodate people like me at all. What so did you What did you learn um, by founding? First of all, let me acknowledge what you just said. I, I don't want to just that's rude of me and, and insensitive to just <laughs> blaze through to the next question. You just said something extremely important, um, and I want to appreciate. I want to just let you know how much we appreciate your candor and your vulnerability here in talking about this. Um, actually, this is probably a perfect time for those that are watching, for those that are seeing this on YouTube, not listening to the podcast, uh, to point out that at cstroop.com on your website, we, we can meet Chrissy Stroop, how Chrissy became herself. This is really interesting. I haven't seen this on a lot of websites. Um, you, you know, you quote Church Clarity, calling you a writer, scholar, a thought leader, religion and politics, referring to you as ex-evangelicals, prophetic voice. Um, but this is an interesting timeline that we don't often see from public commentators what really jumped out at me here, you say you're from 1980 to 99, you're indoctrinated uh, mm -hmm. at church and in Christian schools. And it goes through right here till 2014. You call this your queer epiphany in 2014, <laughs> yeah. or your epiphany. If gender and sexuality operate independently, holy wow. Uh, <laughs> was 2014 your, your official divorce from religion or from evangelicalism? Uh, I would say that, no, I stopped being an evangelical back in, in 2002, and I told a few people about that privately. I'd really hope that some other people were evolving the same way from my childhood, but they weren't. Uh, not the people that I talked to anyway, and not most people from my Christian school or that I knew from, from back then from, from my childhood. Uh, so I kept a lot of things quiet for the next 12 or 13 years there. Uh, and just tried to uh, focus on on scholarship and um, getting my PhD in modern Russian history, where I ended up studying um, religious ideology in the late imperial Russian public sphere and sort of through the, the revolution and uh, into the 1920s and 30s, where I started focusing on the, the Russian diaspora and its influence on um, anti-communism as it developed in, in the 20th century outside the Soviet Union. Uh, which would eventually, you know, bring us back around to the, the Christian right and how much they love people like Solzhenitsyn and before him, Dostoevsky. It all came full circle because I really was, uh, you know, still working on myself, trying to figure out myself through the scholarship that I was doing. And I think most people, for most people who, who pursue a PhD, there's, there's some serious personal reason why they do. Why Russia? Well, I actually went on short-term mission trips, youth mission trips. It's very embarrassing to talk about it now because I don't really support missionary enterprises at all. And I certainly don't support uh, sending 
young people across the globe to to think that they somehow can can teach the locals and that they need to convert them. Um, but that's what I was doing in, in Russia, post-Soviet Russia, where I thought there would be a lot of atheists. So, and I was kind of okay with that at the time. Like, okay, yeah, we can try to convert atheists to Christianity. But it turned out that basically everyone who came to these kind of bait and switch summer camps that we were doing that were called English camps, because we were supposed to be tutoring them in English, but then we only used materials that were like English translations of the Bible. And we shared our testimonies and that kind of thing. Turned out we were trying to convert Orthodox Christians to Christianity, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, that was actually part of my deconstruction. And, and so, you know, in, in college, I just also had some fabulous history professors. And that's how I decided that history was what I wanted to pursue for uh, postgraduate study. And so that then the mission trip experience and learning Russian because I had some Russian friends was how I ended up gravitating toward Russian studies. And then I ended up studying, you know, for my dissertation, these late 19th, early 20th century Russian Christian intellectuals who, uh, you know, once you kind of parse that that heady um, sort of fonde cicla idiom, uh, they sound a lot like Russian Franklin Grahams. <laughs> What did you learn from, I mean, you, you, you found this, um, these hashtags empty the pews, which, which has been enormous. Um, and people can, people can spend hours on there reading a lot of the, the tweets and stuff people have submitted firsthand experiences. Um, exposed Christian schools is another one. What did you, what did you learn about that? I mean, you have your own personal experience. Uh, you have sort of the intellectual exercise, um, but, but this is anecdotal and this is real life. And this is, this is people, if, if, if I can co-opt the word, it, it's people providing their own testimony on their own experience. What did you learn from that? Or what did it reiterate yeah. in your own mind? Actually, I love calling that, you know, testimony or, or bearing witness or something like that and kind of throwing that, that language back at evangelicals. But, um, you know, what we've learned from doing these hashtag campaigns and there are others uh, there's been hashtag Christian alt facts, hashtag church two, which I, I did not start that one. That was Emily Joy and Hannah Posh building on me too. And so exposing abuse and sexual assault in, in these kinds of church environments, particularly evangelical environments, uh, hashtag rapture anxiety. Um, we've learned that there are a whole lot of people that were, ha had similar experiences of being traumatized by, um, Christian indoctrination and hardline ideology and apocalyptic views and so forth. I mean, evangelicals are the kind of people who show um, apocalypse horror movies to six-year-olds and um, expect them to just be fine having just seen people get their heads chopped off for believing in Jesus. And they also think that that's, you know, going to happen any day now, which is ridiculous. Um, but, you know, turns out a whole lot of people were like, oh yeah, I thought I was the only one. And so finding others on Twitter has been, I think, for many people, a sort of healing thing. Obviously, it's not a replacement for therapy, um, but just to know that you're not alone is great. And then from another angle, when these hashtags trend, sometimes they, they get media coverage. And I think that's important because I think we need to have collective visibility for the people that have been harmed uh, by being raised in high control religious groups. Uh, high control religious denominations or sort of just broad uh, religious groups like evangelicalism, which for the most part is authoritarian. Um, you know, authoritarian um, child rearing is not good for children. And so a lot of us have serious uh, psychological damage. A lot of people also um, have had trouble with um, forming stable relationships or uh, people have a variety of PTSD from this. Uh, people get triggered even just by entering churches. Um, there's there's a whole lot of this out there. People don't want to talk about it. And what I've really been trying to do for the last several years is trying to force people to talk about it. And uh, I started kind of talking about it myself in 2015 publicly when I was starting to do some writing for the popular press. And um, I published this, this article that was very critical of um, American evangelical subculture for the first time, caused a lot of fallout with my family. Uh, but it was absolutely worth it. And from that point on, you know, it's been finding, a lot of us have been finding each other online, um, creating support groups, mostly online, but sometimes off as well. And um, doing these hashtag campaigns occasionally. Um, they've Chrissy, mostly been pretty, pretty spontaneous and not that organized, but they've, in some cases, they've really blown up. Do you have your family's support currently? 
Um, that's an interesting question. I would say that my parents, I do have support from them uh, in, in some ways. Um, you know, my mom says that I'm a good writer and she's proud of me and the things that I write make her sad. Um, yeah. And, and I, you know, my parents, though, I would say, yeah, they've been they've been supportive in a lot of ways. Because um, this is, but this is, they it's, don't, don't want to cut off a child. I didn't expect that, to be honest. I, I, ex- I didn't mean to interrupt you. I apologize. I, I, I just, it, it's, it's difficult, isn't it, though? To, well, I, I don't want to speak on on your behalf, but f- close friends of mine um, still attend church and are raising their kids in the church, and people that I love attend church, and their faith is the most important thing to them, and. Um, mm-hmm. I know that some people that that I care about very much will perceive even the fact that we're having this conversation uh, to be an attack on them, um, to be an attack on their intelligence, to be an attack on their faith. Um, it's not. Um, and and if we're going to call a show Real Talk and not talk about this kind of stuff, then we might as well fold the tent. Um, but it can be difficult. And, and the personal journey for people out of organized religion as well, I think is, I mean, it's a personal journey for everybody. It looks different, but it's no small thing and it does not happen overnight, at least not for me, no. at least not for a lot of other people. Yeah. I mean, sometimes people are just sort of able to be like, well, it's all bullshit and leave, but that's, I don't think that's most people's experiences. No. And I think that usually people who, who do that do tend to be, um, you know, uh, cisgender, heterosexual white males, but uh, certainly many of them also come out with a, a lot of trauma from this. So for many people, it's absolutely not an easy process of leaving because it is does come with such a social cost, which is also why it comes with such a, such a huge psychological cost. Because uh, this is your community, as you, as you said. I still know a lot of people in this as well. I think it's sad that they perceive me simply just trying to fight for the right to exist as myself as an attack, but they perceive any and all sort of difference in criticism as an attack. So, so what can you do? Um, again, sometimes with patients, you know, you can, you can kind of get somewhere and, and, um, have some kind of decent relationship with, with people if they're willing to, to listen. And over time with my parents, that has happened. Um, you know, it hasn't happened with everyone in the family, but I'm a lot luckier, um, with my relatives and family experience than than some people are because many people, uh, from this background just end up you know, having to cut family off or being cut off before they can cut them off. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a messy thing. Um, you know, one of my family members has, um, accused me of hating my entire childhood. That is not true, you know, and it, and it's not fair, but they have to throw these kinds of things at you because they're afraid of self-reflection. Uh, Lindsay, um, I don't know anything. Uh, well, maybe I do. Maybe I, I'm not sure. Lindsay is watching now live and she says deprogramming is tough work. Um, says particularly for those of us who are subjected to purity culture. Um, Lindsay says, I'd love for that, uh, to be a point that we reach in this discussion. Um, does purity culture mean something to you? I'm not sure exactly what Lindsay means. I don't know if that means, is, is she talking literally about saving yourself till marriage and that kind of a thing? Or is that something else, Chrissy, that Lindsay's talking well, about? Well, yeah, I I mean, that's kind of the the core of it, but there's so much more to it Uh, in the United States. And and, uh, I think the heyday of this was the 90s, but it still exists and it's sort of taking new forms now. Uh, Purity culture became this this huge thing. Uh, You know, Josh Harris published his book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Right. There was this widespread belief that, um, you know, the, the first person that you kiss, the first person that maybe you even hold hands with should be the person that you marry. And and so this whole idea of stepping way back from uh, just a healthy, normal youth relationships and the learning experiences that you get from that um, and intense guilt and shame that, that goes with it. And if you get any sex education at all, it's just full of alternative facts and, and fear mongering. So I'll give you an example. Um, in seventh grade at Colorado Springs Christian Middle School, uh, my entire class was bussed away for a sort of quote uh, retreat day, uh, one day during that school year, and so that would have been 1994, uh, roughly 1994. Yeah, uh, and um, so yeah, we were kind of separated into to different groups, uh, boys and girls, and you know, told certain things. But then we were also like all together 
in sort of um, like stadium seats toward the end of the day. And this I remember very distinctly. Uh, we were told that um, if you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend now, you shouldn't do anything that you wouldn't do with someone else's husband or wife because you're probably not going to marry them. And if you do, you are cheating on their future spouse and on your future spouse. Um, you know, we also got a whole lot of, you know, condoms never work, condoms can't prevent the AIDS virus, uh, condoms don't stop pregnancy. Um, and then, you know, this very manipulative sort of spiel where we were told to uh, come down and receive a purity pledge, this little card that you have to fill out to pledge to stay pure until marriage, but it's a vow that you're making to God. And then we were told uh, to go off and sit by ourselves in this sort of like gymnasium space and uh, prayerfully consider whether uh, we can, in good conscience, sign this pledge. Now, I know I wasn't the only one thinking that, okay, this feels manipulative and this doesn't feel good. Um, even though I agree that we should wait till marriage, I don't think I like this whole pledging thing. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm sure I also wasn't the only one thinking, uh, but if I don't sign this pledge, are they going to expel me? Will they fire my mom, who was, you know, a teacher in the elementary school? Uh, so uh, I signed the pledge. And I think pretty much everybody did because you really didn't know. I mean, people just disappeared from that school sometimes. And it turns out they got expelled for, for one thing or another. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's intense. I mean, and we're not also... even getting into like there's the. The, I, I don't want to sit here and I, I, you know, it's, it's so funny, Chrissy. I even still find myself now. There's a voice in my head saying like, don't pile on. Don't like, and I, and I do, I do sincerely feel I want to respect people and I do respect people or for their beliefs. I mean, there, there, let me, let me get to, you know what? Sometimes people express things way better than I can. So I'm going to get to our chatterbox here. Lynn is watching. Lynn says as a parent of a transgender child, uh, Chrissy, I want to thank you for being your authentic self. She goes on to say, I don't have a problem with religion in general. Uh, but the evangelical movement and religions that use their power and their control to discriminate against people is hugely problematic. Not all are like this. I think Lynn hits the nail on the head. Um, I, I, I respect people's faith. I know people's faith is very important to them, but I also look at trends and I look at what comes from religion and it can have a devastating impact on people. You know, the, these father daughter dances mm -hmm. where the dad gives the daughter a purity ring and there's this really in my mind an unhealthy relationship between the daughter and the father um it's it's sort of the the uh, the religious infusion of the idea of the dad on the front porch with the shotgun when the girl gets picked up by the i mean there's there's just a lot of weirdness um uh, that comes along with it and uh i feel like chrissy is frozen on the screen i think that might be a, i was thinking boy is she ever intently listening to what i have to say and i uh, there we are okay we've got you back <laughs> but you know what i'm saying i mean there's just yeah there's, sorry there's, i there's a lot of that Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard everything that you said, okay, but uh, I got a, I got a message flashing unstable internet connection, which um, now it's gone. So we have I you. Guess. We have you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, all of those things are associated with purity culture and also the modesty culture that is um, enforced primarily against girls. Uh, I, I mean, all of this disproportionately affects girls and women because it's their sexuality that has to be mostly, you know, controlled, that is most fearful. And there are more excuses made for boys' sexuality, like boys are lust monsters, right? They're, it's just inevitable. Um, and so my Christian school still back in, in that time had skirt checks. And I think until fairly recently it did. I, I'm told now because my mom teaches in the Christian school that I graduated from that they do not do skirt checks anymore, but they would sometimes humiliate a girl in front of an entire class, make her kneel and see if her skirt reached um, the floor. And if it didn't, she would be, she would have to change or she would be sent home if she, um, you know, had nothing to change into and there was nothing in the office or whatever that she could change into. Um, Chrissy, so I got yeah. sent, I got sent to the office once because my Voirne France t-shirt was the anarchy logo turned upside down. Uh, so <laughs> well, did you know, did you know that the peace sign is an inverted broken cross? The, it's satanic. You got it. And, and, and ACDC <laughs> stands for against Christ devil's children. And there's all the, I mean, it's just, it really gets to a point where when, when you're out of it and, and listen, there's going to be people right now saying, um, yeah, damn straight. We're, we're going to put modesty culture in front of our kids because we want our kids to grow up, you know, valuing the, 
sanctity of marriage or we believe that, you know, we want to help our kids through the tough times of adolescence or we're, you know, we don't want our kids to make, you know, people will mm. use kind of that as, as a parameter, I think, for for good or positive behavior in a way. If you want to help your kids through adolescence, don't shame them over modesty. <laughs> well, sure. And I, and I just think when you look back at, when I look back at some of the stuff, it's, um, it's paranoia. And I look back at, and I, and I, and again, I mean, just to say it, I mean, you, you know, you talk about the, some of the documentaries that are shown and things like that. I mean, kids understanding what hell is and the, the burning and the gnashing of teeth and, and the songs that the young learners are singing onward, Christian soldiers marching into war. I mean, all this, I'm in the Lord's army. I'm in the Lord's yeah. army. Like, I mean, all this stuff, it's like, what are these? I mean, this is being ingrained in young people's brains. And, um, Oh, sure. All of a sudden, Being told from five or six years old that, you know, the world is full of these evil liberals that murder babies and we have to stop them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's all of a sudden not too far of a stretch to drive your pickup truck through the front door of an abortion clinic. Right. Like it's you. That's where it comes from. Um, and or to invade the Capitol when a Democrat is elected president. Yeah. Yeah. It's called terrorism and it's called extremism. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for whatever reason, um, a lot, well, I know the reasons, but people are afraid to say it and people are afraid to talk about it. Um, and I, and I appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, I know that not everybody that's watching this or that's going to hear this podcast. I, I, I can already tell you, I know this podcast is going to, is going to explode. Um, not everyone will agree. Mark writes in to simply say in all caps, great guest. He says, I'm not going to touch on the religious part. Mark says, I, I think freedom of religion is a right, uh, but she is a logical and critical thinker and articulate guests like this should dominate your shows. That from Mark. I think that's pretty well, amazing feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I do want to clarify that I also support religious freedom, but the kind of religious freedom that I support is, is a religious freedom that is compatible with pluralism, which, as I understand it, uh, means equal accommodation of all in the public square. And so... You know, I don't want to stop Christians from practicing their faith, uh, but I don't agree that it's a, a sort of valid expression of faith if, if their faith requires them to, you know, tell me I have to stop taking hormones and stop wearing women's clothing. You know, um, they don't have the right to do that. They have the right to believe that it's wrong, but they don't have the right to use the law to stop me. But that's what they're the people that I have a problem with are trying to do. Uh, but, you know, I advocate pluralism. I'm not anti-religious. I'm not anti-Christian. I'm quite proud that I frequently work with uh, social justice oriented Christian organizations, as well as with atheists and secular organizations. And, um, you know, in, in the secular and atheist community, I also really try to advocate for, for pluralism because there are a number of people there who uh, see themselves. I mean, one person I, I had asked a question after a talk um, who said, well, do you think we're losing this war? against organized religion. And I was like, if you're at war with organized religion, then yeah, that's the lost cause. But why are you at war? I'm not at war with organized religion. <laughs> I just want their right to, uh, you know, exist and uh, have the same rights as everyone else. I've got uh, a buddy by the name of Jeff. Uh, I just love him dearly. And, uh, and I know him to be a man of great integrity and wisdom. And I trust his opinions on this. Um, and he's a man of conviction. And he tweets at me and he says, after yesterday's discussion on eating disorders and the current discussion about evangelicalism, I feel like you're purposefully messing with us over here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, I know Jeff can handle the tough conversations. I know that that's why he shows up as an audience member and a friend of Real Talk. That's why I'm here, Chrissy. That's why I'm so grateful that you've been here. Um, you and I were joking uh, off air. I said, I think we, you and I could probably talk for a week. And I think that we're just scratching the surface, but you've given us so much to think about. I want to encourage people um, to check out your book. I want to encourage people to check out your website, cstroop.com, to follow you on Twitter. Uh, they can link to that b uh, by way of my tweet that I sent out earlier this morning with the guest lineup here, uh, and we'll continue this conversation. I look forward to connecting with you again. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, it's been great, and I look forward to connecting with you again as well. That's fantastic. That's uh, Chrissy Stroop, uh, the co-editor of the book Empty the Pews, Stories of Leaving the Church. 
uh, an ex-evangelical writer, a speaker, an advocate focused on religion, politics, and foreign policy uh, with a doctorate. I, I should have been referring to Chrissy, quite frankly, as Dr. Stroop the entire time. Let's not deny her her PhD from a, a small, you may have heard of it before, uh, Stanford University. Um, Ooh, you, oh, you've I've heard of that You may one. have heard of Stanford. Uh, yeah. doc, Dr. Stroop is, uh, earned a PhD in modern Russian history from Stanford University. Um, how many of you right now are in a bit of a wind wobble? How many of you right now are, are, are wrestling with a few things? I loved uh, hearing from Julie Rohr, who's just a, a, such a valued member of our listening audience. Julie was, was on the show in our very first week on Real Talk. Um, she says, I'm getting settled in. She said, I was getting settled in for the Chrissy Stroop segment. Uh, she's got an important perspective for those of us still in the church to consider. And Julie, that's an amazing spirit to bring to this exercise, and I really appreciate it. Appreciate the support of uh, our partners that allow interviews like this to continue. They allow us to keep our lights on. They allow us to grow our journey and keep presenting great content like what we just heard from Chrissy Stroop. And that includes the team at Local Waste. For more than a quarter century, they've been going head to head against the faceless big garbage guys, the waste management guys. They can help you sort out your garbage and recycling plan, whether you're a, you know, you're operating out of 500 square feet, a small business, or whether you got a big shopping mall. They've seen it all, and they love to tra- talk trash. So give their team a call today. You can find them online at localwaste.ca. Just follow the links. Uh, that's also where you can find cleanairclub.ca online. And of course, uh, you can find them under the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. We partner with Clean Air Club to make sure that we're doing what we can to purify the air in here. Have we ever been more aware of the importance of healthy living? And that includes the air we breathe. Well, a big part of that is your furnace filter, and that's their business, helping you stay on track. You tell them the furnace filter size you need. They handle the rest. They deliver right to your doorstep. They keep you on schedule. Your family saves money. Your family breathes easier. What's better than that at cleanairclub.ca? Well, we know that our email inbox will uh, be busy uh, this afternoon as some of you sort out what you heard here. Um, I wanted to get to an email before we say goodbye. This one from Erin. I just received this. Uh, Erin, she's tuning in from Drayton Valley, Alberta, a wonderful community uh, west of Edmonton, west of Red Deer, I think probably technically more accurate. Uh, Aaron says, uh, Ryan and Sam, uh, Aaron says, uh, my partner and I tune in every day. And he says, uh, I, I'm going to ignore this stuff. She says he convinced me to listen to you and you're still on that other. Yeah, we don't know. OK, here we are now, Aaron. Here we are now. Says, I remember clearly uh, it says this is relating to your conversation with Senator Doug Black yesterday. I remember clearly the year that Senator Black was elected to the Senate uh, because that is the one and only time I've ever spoiled a ballot says Aaron. Regardless, I I was okay with the senator's win as he always seemed to me to be a reasonable, uh, progressive, conservative style candidate, unlike some of the other reform candidates that we saw in the ballot. Aaron says from the interview uh, that I saw yesterday, I take that he's moved further away from his progressive conservative roots. He seems to have adopted some of the 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 conservative party of Canada, the United Conservative Party style of attack politics. Aaron says it's sad. You know, I didn't agree with most of what he had to say yesterday, but I want you to know that I appreciated the opportunity to hear his views, and I particularly appreciate that you were able to disagree with him. Uh, Many times, you or your guests have encouraged me to examine my decidedly progressive assumptions and consider that there must be a place to meet somewhere in the muddy middle. Aaron says this is the only media platform right now, RyanJesperson.com, that I actively tune into regularly because it's truly balanced. Thank you for that. That from Aaron in Drayton Valley. I appreciate that. That's the most incredible type of praise. And we don't expect that any audience member is going to agree with everything you hear on the show because how boring would that be? Instead, we hope that you leave feeling challenged. We hope that sometimes you leave feeling conflicted. And that we leave you with something to think about for the rest of your day. Tomorrow's show is going to be a great one. As mentioned, we're going to touch into that new strain of COVID-19. What do you need to know about there? And then on Friday, a great show already brewing. We've got a couple exclusives coming up in the next week. You won't want to miss. Keep it locked right here on Real Talk. We'll talk to you soon.